Hi, welcome to the Brick Filmers Guild podcast, hosted by us, the Four Monkeys. On this podcast, we had the extreme pleasure of chatting with the very talented and super nice David Pagano of Paganimation. David has been brick filming for well over 20 years and produced many of the Lego Group's promotional brick films over the last decade. He is the co-author of the Lego Animation Book, two-time BFG Brick Filmer of the Year, and first-time inductee into the BFG Hall of Fame. I want to give an extra quick shout out to our wonderful Patreon supporters, Something's Arrive Productions, Frame 5 Studios, Mind Game Studios, Dark Dragon Films, Forest Fire 101, Spencer Katz, Paganimation, William Osborne, Sam Futhy, and The Tenacious Brick. Thank you so much for supporting our podcasts. This podcast is sponsored by FX Home, the makers of HitFilm Pro, HitFilm Express, Emerge Pro, and more. HitFilm Express is a free video editing software with professional-grade VFX tools. It's a perfect fit for the average brick filmer's budget. HitFilm Pro is the top choice for video artists worldwide. In a single product, you get editing, compositing, titling, and 3D tools. HitFilm Pro is loaded with tons of professional features. Emerge Pro is a photo editing software that is powerful, easy to use, and a great replacement for what you are using now. Please head over to FX Home to find one of their products that will help you bring your brick films to life. If you would like to help support our podcast, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter. Get podcasts at least two to three weeks before anyone else and other perks only available to our Patreon supporters. So without further ado, here's our conversation with David. Hello, you lovely podcast listeners. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with David Pagano of Paganimation, the very talented, wonderful, just everything you know him. Here he is. Hey, David, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for all the, the superlatives. <laughs> you you uh, earned those plus so much more. That was just all I could spit out. Spur I'll moment. take it. And thank you for coming back as a guest the second time. That is so awesome. Get yeah, you. I was I was looking and it was uh, 2016 was the last time I was here with uh, uh, my co-author Dave Pickett on the Lego Animation book. Already dropping the uh, the plugs in here. Actually, I was going to do the same thing, so you just beat me to it. So <laughs> save me from having to say all that. Um, which is an amazing book, like which is why we did the podcast with you guys before. Um, and Dave, to this day, still uses that book. Just used it recently on. Um, there was an, an animation uh, contest on a uh, Brick Film Day, and uh, I did the. Um, I guess it's the squish, squash, whatever the animation where you. Oh yeah, the stretch and squash. Stretch and squash. Stretch and stretch. I, think, I think it's page forty-three. Um, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I, I, I could be off by a page, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, it it got me through the first round, but I, uh, I evidently my second round wasn't good enough. <laughs> gotcha. What was the contest? It was uh, like to do uh, animation exercises. Yeah, it was basically uh, Brick Film Day. Every summer had, for the last three or four years has done a little uh, animation contest where they give a theme, and the first theme I think was squash. Um. Or stretch, 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 that's stretch is it, what yeah. it was. So I, I basically made a, a Lego ball, basically based on what your 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 ball in the book is, and I did an animation. I kind of did it flat, and I animated downwards, and um, the judges seemed to like it enough to get me to the second round. So that was cool. Cool, so right on. Thank you for that. <laughs> thank yeah, you, David Pickett. You, you might be the first person who's ever told us that they've done that exercise. Usually, we get people. Uh, you know, we had a. Uh, a, a child made like their own little version of the magic picnic or I think uh, you know I get a lot of people sending me photos of their own uh, Pagano puppets but you, you might be the first to uh, have uh, vocally done the <laughs> the uh, bouncing ball exercise which I think you know in turn we probably took inspiration from I believe like a, a Preston Blair book I had so many books open on my desk when we were writing that and just trying to make sure that uh, we even came close to sounding like we knew what we were talking about. I've never felt so much like I did not know animation until I tried to write it down and teach it to others. 
if if I'm not incorrect, I think that was the chapter you said that nearly broke you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what Dave Pickett always describes. Oh, maybe it was yeah. Dave Pickett that said that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just because it was, you know, you you we're all animators here. Uh, you just do the animation, and sometimes it's it's, it's more of a feeling than it is a uh, you know a strip set of program commands you know line 10 put the character here line 20 move it like it's 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 more physical it's more instinctual sometimes so trying to actually actively reflect on what it is you do step by step and then write it down in a way that anyone can understand it was uh it was very it was very difficult and, and surprisingly so i remember yeah, I can understand that because it's different when you're like with a group of people or kids or grownups, whatever, you know, showing them what you do. But to actually have to write it down in a way that, you know, a youngster or anyone can understand. Yeah, that's completely Old different. Old man like me, yeah. <laughs> well, anybody. Yeah. Much harder. Well, it's like, like, how do you ride a bicycle? I don't know. You get on and you pedal. But that's not really like a how-to, though. You have to think of, okay, well, you balance yourself and you hold the handlebars and you have to kind of like shift your weight there's all this like stuff that is uh, yeah it's just it sort of happens it just sort of happens it's easier to do it than to to write it down and say it exactly right well there is a book now that you can look at that's very (laughs) clear and concise about how to do the lego animation brick filming and it's it's yours and david's book yes the lego animation book highly recommend not just for kids like i said dave is still using it um, it, it is just, it's an incredible book to help anybody of any age. So uh, you're both very kind from so, ages, from ages nine to 99. There you Sorry. Go. <laughs> Where have I seen that? <laughs> Sorry, a hundred year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> so, um, do you know how many, uh, have been printed and sold by chance? Uh, whew, off the top of my head. It's always the numbers, right? Um, I love numbers. I, I know, <laughs> I think that we've, uh, Oh, you know, I bet you I could pull up our, our, oh, hold on one second. It's all good. All good. And while you're looking that up, do you know how many languages it's been printed in? Languages I know. It's, um, we've got it in English, um, German, Polish. I want to, I want to say French. Uh, There's, you know, we're supposed to, as, as the authors, we're supposed to get, um, copies of the book when it's it's translated into other languages um you know unfortunately once that happens it's usually foreign publishers who license it uh from our publisher and so once it goes into other regions and other languages we don't really have any control over that um so uh i, I think simplified chinese was supposed to be one but we've never seen at least I've, I've never seen a copy of it maybe uh dave pickett has been uh uh more, more um, has his fingers more on the pulse of <laughs> the Lego animation book in other regions, but yeah, no, those those are the main ones. Um, you know, we've got I've got a lot of people asking me why why we don't have one in Spanish, and I think yeah, that would I'm be surprised. Very cool. Yeah, me too, honestly. Um, I think you know it depends. Uh, I imagine on what the the main uh, the, the most prominent brick filming regions are, right? Like we know Germany is obviously the the biggest region, or at least it was you know, 10 years ago for, uh, for Lego sales outside of Denmark, right? Like that's why, uh, there was this old thing that they used to say at like the Lego Q and A's at events where it's like, if, the, if a set doesn't sell in Germany, it's not going to get sold. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if that's, you know, changed in, in the way they also used to say that, you know, uh, adult fans were like three to 5% of the <laughs> total sales or something like that. Um, which I, I, I feel like everyone thought was like, a, a bit of a denial, but I, I, last last I checked, I think they were up to like twenty in terms of uh, their admission. Oh, I yeah. should actually check these facts. I'm just saying stuff on this. Oh, what's I don't think okay is this allowed? It's okay is this allowed? People just say anything on podcasts, don't they? <laughs> it's People okay. Can. To I don't think anybody's going to check your facts. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just for this country alone, I'm surprised that it's not in Spanish because pretty much everything in this country, whether it's on the phone or anything you buy, is either you know English or Spanish. So I'm really surprised. Uh, that's For sure. Not one of them. Well, and certainly, um, you know, it's tough also because I know with the the Polish version, we've gotten some feedback where, you know, one of our uh, followers messaged me and was like, "Hey, what do you call that stuff? That's um, like the the little sticky 
material that you put down under minifigures when you're animating them. And I was like, oh, you mean like, like blue tack or sticky tack? And this person was like, yeah, um, I don't know who like translated this book, but they're calling it window glue. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> so, and what we've, what we've been given to understand is that the Polish version of the Lego animation book was like a soft Google Translate, essentially, of <laughs> the English version, which is just like, come on, guys. Like, you're just, Well, at least you're you didn't have to worry about them moving, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take, wow. take the time to actually uh, translate That's kind of an important <laughs> thing to get right there, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, just a little bit. So just curious, like, when was the last time you saw David? I imagine you guys talk a lot, and uh, if, you're, if you've been able to get together recently. You know, we haven't. It's only, you know, uh, obviously, uh, COVID being what it is, I actually haven't seen Dave Pickett since uh, we went to Star Wars Celebration together um, in 2019. That was oh, the wow. last time. That was the last time I was out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's every time I, you know, hang out with someone lately, it's it's it's, co- it's this constant thing of, wait, how long has it been since I've seen you? Where did we see each other last? You know, uh, even on my, uh, and I'll I'll get to the uh, <laughs> the number of book uh, book printings in a sec, but even on on uh, you know, I have the uh, Ernest Goes to podcast that I do with my friend Aaron. And even on that, when we came back for the first time after, you know, being away for so long during the pandemic, it was, you know, it was just surreal and bizarre and trying to remember like, well, how do we do this? What do we do? (laughs) Not even recording a podcast, but interacting with humanity. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's very, it's very, uh, I believe she mentioned that she had to relearn all of her fakery to, uh, (laughs) to get back on the, on the, uh, Interacting with people train, and I, I certainly agree. Um, it looks like, uh, okay, let's see. Lego Animation book, copies printed, uh, oh no, lifetime copies, 44,636 wow. as, as of uh, June of this year. That's so, so awesome. That is awesome. Thanks. Yeah, and foreign rights, da, da, da. that doesn't tell me anything. Okay, uh, this is... Uh, a difficult document to read, so I'm going to close it. That's all good. Um, That's but, all good. Well, since, <laughs> but since no, no I, yeah, I've just been, I've, I've, you know, David Pickett and I chat. Uh, I would say I, I probably like text him like once a month. Well, that counts. Uh, that counts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, um, yeah, it's 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 tough because you know, I think even before even before the pandemic, there was you know a slight shift away from us seeing each other so often, like like. You know, back back in the halcyon days of the <laughs> Lego, of Lego animation, um, you know, we would see each other every year at Brickworld uh, oh, in Chicago. Right. Chicago, yeah. Um, and you know, that that was sort of the genesis for the Lego animation book was the class that he and I taught together. Um, and since I guess probably 2017 was, I think, the last time I was at that event. Um, and you know, certain things have sort of diverted our uh, separate careers you know even even beyond the pandemic it's like you know i think the the uh what was it called the youtube ad apocalypse really um put a hit on on how brick 101 was mm-hmm. uh in in that sort of youtube sphere and you know certainly uh i think the 2016 i, I believe was was that the year that uh Lego laid off like 1400 people or something. Um, so that kind of affected, you know, how often I work with the, the folks that I had been working with for almost a decade. So, so we've sort of both, you know, we haven't, I wouldn't say we've drifted apart, certainly not personally, but, um, you know, our career paths, you know, Dave's, uh, pursuing game design now. And, yeah, uh, I've been, I follow I, him I, on Twitter. I, yeah, I've seen a bunch of that stuff. Yeah. It's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if you look at what he creates and what he does now, and you consider it, it through the lens of the nightly news at nine, uh, um, it's like, oh, this makes total sense. Like this is this is a very logical with with the <laughs> with the the clarity of hindsight. It's like, oh yeah, of course this makes sense. But you know, I know when we were both in the thick of like trying to figure out where our career paths were were uh, heading, uh, it was a little bit more. Um, there's a little bit more sweat, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
Things have definitely changed a lot for everybody, that's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. And you're, I mean, my, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I mean, we don't even have, like, there's no Paganobation studio right now. There's there's a, uh, a, a spare bedroom that I borrow, and that's basically it, and a bunch of stuff stored in boxes. Um, and it's only been, you know, this past spring that I put two bricks together for the first time since probably 2019. I think oh, the last really? thing I built before that was the, uh, I did a, a Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure Lego Ideas project uh, that uh, unfortunately did not uh, go anywhere, even though Alex Winter liked it. That was but, unfortunate, uh, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, and you know, <laughs> just as a sidebar about that, uh, it, it's it's another thing, I, I was reading a, a book about Lego's business sense from, I believe, 2013 or 2012 and it was it was sort of it was a book about how to uh take the lessons that lego learned from their near bankruptcy in the early 2000s like back when uh, you know for your younger listeners back when the the grays and the browns were changing and uh jack stone was the hot new item and uh mm-hmm. we all we all collectively love galador um, which i still have a galador figure on my shelf but i digress <laughs> um yeah oh, those and, the tall you know, ones yeah, the first, the sort of the first uh, attempt after Bionicle to make what they now call a construction figure, um, and I think it just it for a lot of people it went a little bit too far from what makes something inherently Lego. Uh, even though you know I was at uh, Brick Fair Virginia a few years ago, and uh, uh, Matthew Ewald, the, one of the actors from Galador, the the main actor was there, and there was a, a really vocal contingent of Galador fans who were showing off all of their Galador models and things that they had, these weird creatures that they had made with those parts. So, you know, and anytime I hear uh, somebody in the fan community express that, you know, oh, this part is, this part is too single use. You can't use it for anything else. I'm like, oh, you're just not, you're not using your imagination enough. And isn't that the whole uh, point of Lego, you know, to get yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with like, you know, this certainly the stuff that I do. It's it's all about like, oh, there's this weird, excuse me, there's this weird part. Um, what can I use this for? You know, I think in uh, the example I always give from Little Guys in Space is that uh, that soldier mom, the future war soldier mom, who uh, her shoulder pads are upside down pirate ship hulls. I was about to bring what, that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once, yeah that... once I saw those pieces, I was like, these look like shoulder pads. I got to do something with that. <laughs> Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> um, uh, I think we were Galador. trying to go into oh, Galador. I was talking about yeah. the uh, the Legos uh, business sense. So what I saw in that book was there was a quote attributed to one of the Lego uh, employees, uh, and they were saying, like, they were expressing something basically like, our financial situation was such that we had to work with the fans because we had no choice. Um, and I was like, that's kind of a weird... <laughs> sentiment to express it's it kind of feels like oh well we not very warm and fuzzy yeah we would have we wouldn't have done this otherwise um and i think you know certainly with stuff like the the lego ideas stuff it really it, in some ways it's hard to not feel like you know with, without coming across as sour grapes it's hard to not feel like lego ideas is by and large a way to get free marketing and market research from a fan community um, and, and in certainly in a, a time where Lego doesn't really need it, like they're not hurting in the way that they were, uh, in the early two thousands when that, when that book, the, the time period that book kind of focuses on. So, so it's a little weird, but that's, that's my aside about the, uh, <laughs> Bill and Ted's, uh, excellent adventure project I made. Well, it was a really I, cool set. Yeah, it really was awesome. Thank you. And I did my part to share it. And yeah, uh, the fact that you had it. the actor as well. I mean, that's just, I, I thought for sure it was going to go through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, certainly the pandemic was not a time when people were, you know, every, everyone was sort of like insulated in a weird way. And I think there was there was a lot of distraction and there was a lot of background noise. And I think it was hard for for anyone to. I don't know. It was championing, champion, blah, blah, championing, championing. Uh, sort of uh, creative projects that have no 
real benefit um, <laughs> apart from just being neat. Uh, I think it was a, it was a weird time for that, um, and I think a lot of people, like I was saying earlier, uh, I don't remember if this was before or after we started recording, but uh, you know, pe- that that tweet that said people were expecting you know 140 percent productivity when really they should be expecting 40 percent less than normal. Uh, yeah, but that was the yeah that was the last thing I built until I built a little model for the the 15th anniversary of Little Guys earlier this year. And it was, uh, I missed it. I forgot how much I missed building. It, it had been so long. Yeah, I go through my hot and cold phases. And uh, this late summer has been a pretty good hot phase for me. So I've actually been semi-productive. I've actually been uh, animating some uh, some of my Pagano puppets. So Nice. Uh, so, um, that, that, I didn't pay been... him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. You're you're a huge influence to, to so many people, but yeah, especially Dave. He uses so many of your things and uh Oh, thank you. I can't hear that kind of thing enough. <laughs> so, uh you know, uh t- teaching and speaking engagements, um have you only I I know you did uh, a a really cool speech out at um uh, out in I think near San Francisco at um Bricks by, Bricks the, by Bay. the Bay. Um but uh or most of your most of your speaking engagements or, or your teaching opportunities is that at a Brick World Chicago or have you um, and how many times you've done that and have you done it in other um, 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 Lego f- uh, festivals or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I, most of my teaching and speaking engagements, I've sort of uh, I've been the one to kind of drive them to happen. Like the <laughs> the way that I ended up being, uh, you know. The very official title of cinema coordinator at uh, Brick World Chicago was I went up to the the guy who ran the event at the time and I was like, hey, do you have a cinema coordinator? And he was like, nope. And I was like, can I be it? And he was like, yep. <laughs> and that was, that was basically it. You know, I think, I don't know how much experience y'all have with uh, LEGO fan events, but there, I don't know if it's changed now. I can't imagine it has, but... Uh, Brick filming is, does not have a huge presence at them, and I think that was one of the reasons that uh, Dave and I sort of Dave Pickett. There's a lot of Daves in this man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he really is. <laughs> that's one of the reasons that uh, Dave Pickett and myself, David Pagano, uh, sort of gravitated towards each other was just that like we were the only two folk. We were this uh, representation of a niche hobby within an event that's already kind of a niche hobby. So I think we, uh, you know, we sort of came together just because we were the only ones. Um, but, uh, you know, brick world is where I've talked the most certainly. And, uh, I, I did do when I did that, uh, that keynote speech at uh, bricks by the bay in, uh, San Francisco, I did a, a workshop class there too. Um, and it's just, it's just fun. And it's always, you know, when you see people doing animation for the first time and, and really getting it, This is not a commentary on my uh, abilities as an instructor by any means, but just sort of like, excuse me, watching them learn by, uh, by doing essentially. Um, and, and seeing, seeing the light bulb kind of go off in in certain ways or with certain uh, approaches or techniques. It's, it's very inspiring because it takes you back to that. You know, it's like, uh, it's like watching a little kid watch Star Wars for their first time. If you've seen Star Wars like a million times, it, it, you get that sort of like that new energy of like, oh, this is cool. Uh, and uh, so, so that's sort of a big part of why I continue to do sort of teaching engagements and, and speaking. I did, um, a friend of mine has, she works with like a group that does uh, connect speakers with like middle school uh, classes and so I, I talked to some middle schoolers. I think, uh, gosh, you know, that's the other thing about the pandemic is that time is just like a, <laughs> a, a varied and confusing prospect. Um, but I think it was um, late last year I talked to a bunch of middle schoolers. And it was basically just about, like, my career uh, and, and how I got to where I am. And, you know, it's, again, the thing of, like, hindsight, it, it seems much clearer and more logical when you've already gone through it. But when you're in the middle of it, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I, I just try to, I like giving uh, people who are interested in the same things that I am, uh, the benefit of uh, 
all of the mistakes that I've made <laughs> so that uh, hopefully they don't have to do the same ones. And, you know, the next, the next generation is uh, better for the experience. Yeah, I think the cool. more people you can spread that to, um, yeah. the better. And it's not, and, and to learn from someone like you is an honor, really. These kids don't understand yet, uh, but I mean, but, you can, but you're contagious because you can see how much you enjoy it. And that really comes across. So you're really the perfect person to do that. And, and, and you do have a, a, a great sense of public speaking because you had a really live audience at the Bricks by the Bay and you just rolled with them and had fun. And I, uh, yeah, I just recently re-listened to that as like, and it really wasn't, it was more about, you know, be yourself and enjoy your hobby. And it wasn't as much about brick filming, but you, you really had fun with the audience and the audience was just live as can be. They were really, um, act, you know, active and, uh, and, and loud in the audience and you just went with it. Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah. It's, it, gosh, it's been years since I, <laughs> Cause I was, uh, I think I was still in my twenties, uh, <laughs> when I did that. And yeah, it's, it's been a while since I've reviewed it myself. Uh, believe it or not, I don't, I don't go back and, uh, <laughs> listen to myself talk as, as much as, uh, one might expect. But, uh, yeah. And the thing about that was, uh, I had just, I kept a, like a running notepad document on my phone that was like, uh, I something like ideas and suggestions for other creative people. And I just like wrote down things like, Oh, I wish I had known this, or I wish this is something that like I see too often and people should really think about or, or stuff like that. Cause yeah, so it was about, you know, I try to keep things positive and, and a lot of it was about, um, you know, sort of how, how to approach your own fandom and how to, uh, be sort of authentically excited about whatever it is you're into. But I also see, you know, there's too much gatekeeping in, in fandom as well. And, and that's something that really, uh, bugs me where it's like, I don't know why do we have to, why do we have to hoard our toys in a, mm-hmm. a figurative or literal sense? Like just, you know, even, even, you know, even some professors that I had where it was like, they would, they would put like a, a, requirement i suppose on on what made someone an animator or not and it's like i'm pretty sure if you if you animate things you're an animator i don't know who made you the arbiter of of what makes somebody an animator or not it's just that's all weird um and i try to uh you know i being i don't know if this is from being a new yorker or not but i i i've been told i don't suffer fools lightly so uh i think just trying to make sure that people can uh enjoy what they enjoy and not have to, you know, worry about it or, or pay, give, give too much credence to, to other people's input. If, uh, if it's, uh, incorrect or negative or stuff like that. Yeah. That's really important. Um, you, you really do have to, I always say, you know, if you enjoy it, that's really all that matters. You're really doing it for you. And if you're happy with what you did, then other people will be too. And if they're not, then they don't matter. It's it's okay because you're never going to please everybody. Um, yeah. But, but you have to please yourself. You're the one that has to be happy and enjoy what you're doing. And if you do, yeah. then you've already succeeded. You got it. I, I think there's a song about that, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> and also, it, um, social media, you know, not everybody. It's sad. There's a, there's a lot of people. Social media does hurt a lot of people. And if you don't have thick skin, um, it, it can be very dangerous and... Uh, I feel sorry for the people that are, are hurting because, you know, people are mean. And that, that's just that's just a fact of life. And you either can handle it, ignore them, or, or cut them off, you know. Just d- don't go on there. Don't, don't give them the power over how you feel. It's their problem, not your problem. That, that's yeah. my strong preach there. <laughs> I love it. No, I'm, I'm behind you 100%. Now, I, uh, yeah. I was, one, one thing I was just going to say was that, you know, in – the past five years, uh, one of the things I did, you know, as it's difficult because as working artists, we are supposed to not only create the art and get jobs creating the art and, you know, make a living, but we're also supposed to be our own entire marketing team in like the modern sort of paradigm. We're supposed to like do all this stuff and network and get our, get our name out there and that kind of a thing. And one of the things that I did, and it was 
wonderful for me personally uh, in the last five years was I completely left Facebook. And I can't tell you how freeing that was because it was, you know, I don't think, I think at the time that I did it, doom scrolling wasn't a phrase mm-hmm. in the vernacular yet. But it, 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 it was just this thing. I was like, I, I, you know, I turned around one day. I was like, why am I here? Like, you know, part of it was um, how much the platform had changed since, you know, again, I'll, I'll show my age. And you know, back when I joined it, it was for colleges only. <laughs> and I joined it because I was a college student. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was like a, uh, I think they, I think there used to be literal Facebooks at college where you could like, uh, you know, sort of get like the contact information for your classmates and like connect with them. Um, someone, someone can fact check me on that too. Well, that's but, a great uh, idea. <laughs> but all the experience I have on that subject is watching the movie, uh, the social network or whatever. Um, I don't know how legit, legitimately truthful that movie was, but <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it kind of tells the story of how, uh, uh, Zuckerberg and, a few other people put put the whole thing together. Here we go. I've, I've fact checked myself. A Facebook is a student directory. This is from Wikipedia, uh, featuring photos and personal information. Okay. Well, there you go. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So if uh, we'll, we'll uh, divert just for a little while away from Le- from Lego to kind of a two pronged uh, um, um, thing in your life, um, Ernest. Oh yeah! Oh, the prongs, uh, the prongs. One prongs the the podcast. The other prong is the documentary. Um, you know, obviously the I guess the podcast came first, um, which I've, I've I've listened to three, and it is on my list of podcasts. So I will uh, I will occasionally slide one of those in, and I'll keep. I'll you know I probably have a few years to get through them all, but it's a really good podcast. Um, you and you and Aaron um, are just incredible uh, host of. Uh, the, the podcast out and if you can remind me what's the name of the podcast uh the name of the podcast is Ernest goes to podcast that makes yeah. sense. No, nothing else we could call it well excellent it's 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 um it's about uh Jim Varney and his character Ernest P Whirl and it's just it's really good and the even the the, the first episode as a brick filmer I got something out of it oh I I'm drawing in Lego to this, but uh, some of the things, some of the themes you were saying, you know, it's like how he's like an animated character and um, that you can basically animate like, like, you know, Ernest in a way. So uh, that was something. And the other thing was he would do these, the commercials before the movies, they were like these 30 second long commercials and he'd have to get it completely correct. And he'd get 20 sec, 20, 28 seconds into it and mess up. He'd have to start over. It's a lot like animating. You're doing a long scene. You get you've been working on it for two or three hours, and you mess something up or whatever, and you got to start over. So it's it's it. I kind of I took some uh, brick filming um, or anim. You know, I guess brick filming um, um, inspiration from that first episode. But I've listened to the the first, the second, and the very last one, which was uh, the one I think the one about the. Um, uh, Ernest um, in the news. And, uh, ah, yes, Ernest and critics. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just a really good podcast, and kudos to to Erin. Uh, she's an incredible co-host with you, um, and 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 she does love Ernest uh, strong arms. That's another thing I got. <laughs> His yes, big muscles. It's, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know, and again, that's another project that it started so long ago that I forget what I've said on it <laughs> but uh yeah no the the idea of it being similar to or analogous to stop motion in the sense that it's like a you know a physical performance that you have to do all in one go yeah that's uh either either that's something i've never thought of before or i've thought of it and forgot about it so i will i will pretend it's the the former and say very, very good observation <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I do enjoy that, and it is in my repertoire, or not repertoire, but my rotation of uh, podcasts to listen to, so uh, I Thank wasn't you. so Podcast sure about cube. it, because I'm not, I mean, I like Ernest, it's funny stuff, but I, I didn't know if I was into Ernest enough to want to listen to a podcast, you and Aaron make it worth listening to, so uh, kudos to y'all. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Aaron and I are both animators, we've known each other for years, um, and I think what... You know, for, for the uninitiated, uh, Ernest P. Worrell was a, a commercial character uh, from the 
early 80s to gosh he was still doing them well, well through the the mid 90s i think um and they were they were all 30 second spots for all kinds of of products and the you know the thing about Ernest was that you know certain commercial characters like uh, you know he gets compared uh, he gets compared to like uh, Flo from the progressive commercials huh. or, or like the, the micro machine man but Ernest was really a character who wasn't he was his own brand character we talk about him on the podcast like he was uh, the original influencer essentially. Uh, because he's he's a brand selling other brands. Ernest does not stand for any one product. He's just like this this <laughs> this cartoon character who's incredibly enthusiastic about you know Sprite and Tyson's Toyota and you know the local news and and you know also doing stuff doing spots for very specific local markets. Everyone thought he was from their hometown, and that sort of like ingratiated him. Uh, further to the people who really loved him. Obviously, there was a lot of people who found him incredibly annoying, and that's sort of, uh, you know, you were talking about the Ernest and Critics episode that we just did and uh, kind of covered the the oversaturation of Ernest. But um, when, you know, not so much when I came to it, but certainly when Aaron came to Ernest as a, a character and as a phenomenon, uh, you know, that oversaturation was long since passed, and... Ernest and Jim Varney were almost like footnotes in like the pop culture consciousness. So, so we started our podcast in 2015, just like we had been talking so much about this Ernest commercial compilation that we had watched that we were like, well, we should just record some of this. Um, and you know, as, as is often the case, uh, again, hindsight, one thing led to another, it makes perfect sense now, but the podcast is how we got connected to, uh, Jim Varney's nephew. Uh, Justin Lloyd, who wrote a biography about his uncle called The Importance of Being Earnest, The Life of Actor Jim Varney. Uh, and uh, he he and I kind of got together and we're like, oh, what if we did like, you know, when he wrote that book, he was like, if I don't write this book, nobody else might ever write one. Uh, and he was kind of perfectly positioned to do that. And because of the podcast, I, I sort of thought I was perfectly positioned to do uh some kind of documentary, you know, knowing Justin, having done all this research, Aaron really is like the, the spearheader of the earnest energy on our show. And I'm sort of the one who does the also deep dives, but on, on more like the, uh, you know, historical record, Dewey decimal system side of things like, Oh, what, 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 what is all this stuff? Let me see how much I can find or uncover. Um, so between the two of us, we have sort of like, uh, the heart and the brain covered and uh we've just yeah we've been exploring this character for years and now it's a documentary which is also called the importance of being earnest because every single person on twitter has made that joke why wasn't there ever a documentary about jim varney called the importance of being earnest and now we just you know me or someone on my uh, documentary crew just like replies to that kind of tweet and it's just like well here is the please pre-order our film please and thank you being earnestfilm.com and so this was a this was a Kickstarter project project that got funded. So you've got that, but you can still uh, uh, still support, contri- it. support it and contribute to it. And um, what yes, buy the please. DVD? Yeah, when it comes the out, DVD that does not exist yet. It is <laughs> we have we used Kickstarter in the literal sense of the word, and I think that's confused a lot of people because Kickstarter has you know in in a similar way to Facebook has also morphed from its initial. Uh, premise, right? Like Kickstarter, it's in the name, like you're there to kickstart a project, but I think a lot of people sort of use it now, not incorrectly, but um, use it as a way of like, oh, we've, we've, we've gotten 90% of the way through our project, like, please help fund us for to like finish it across the finish line. And uh, that's not what our (laughs) documentary uh, fundraiser was. Ours was literally you know, we've done a bunch of research and we've talked to some people and this is our idea. Help us literally kickstart it. Um, and, you know, we uh, we started our recording of interviews this past summer. And, you know, we went to a Ernest Day in Tennessee, which is an annual. It's basically the convention for Ernest fans. Um, 
and you know we were interviewing folks and people were like all right so this is going to be out on youtube like uh, in a couple of weeks right and it's like <laughs> <laughs> you have grossly misunderstood what our uh, goals are um but yeah i mean it's a it's a perfect example of you know i was talking about how i've left facebook and you know just as i as i mature let's say as a as an artist in in what the working uh, yeah, I guess the paradigm of, of making art is in the modern times. I, I, the more I do stuff, the more I find that it isn't right for me. And what I mean by that is, you know, certainly something like YouTube, for example, it's really encouraging people to crank out stuff so fast, so regularly and basically lining them up to burn themselves out. And, you know, certainly as a, a stop motion animator, that's not possible. Like you can't really crank out stop motion. <laughs> it's inherently the, the medium is tied to this idea of, I'm going to do this really slowly. It's going to take a long time. Um, you know, you, you, you're talking to the person who spent uh, seven and a quarter years making a three minute film. So, uh, yeah, just the more I think about like how algorithms and how social media wants artists to put out their art and distribute it and create it, the more, um, I sort of almost have a, an opposite reaction. It's like, okay, well you want me to put out something every week and, uh, tell people to smash that like button. Well, how about this? I'm going to spend five years making a documentary (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's, it. <laughs> it's it's almost it's almost it's almost me sticking it to someone i don't even know who but uh yeah it's it's definitely like a reaction to that in some ways where it's like no i want to like make something of quality i don't i don't want to you know even even talking to you guys today i'm like well gosh where's my i don't have my my nice microphone here is this going to be a problem <laughs> uh, it's it's hard to let go of those uh, uh those meticulous stop motion tendencies uh, and, and i think i am very well suited to stop motion because i have those tendencies not the other way around so they sort of creep into the other uh creative aspects of my life it's like oh i'm, I'm gonna be on this like uh i'm gonna be on this phone interview not not this one right now but like in general it's like oh i don't i don't need to i can just put on my headphones i don't need to set up a professional mic oh i'm recording this this video uh for you know social media i don't need to light it and i don't need to you know use a nice lens i can i can it's it's hard to it's hard to not make every little thing into a project because i think that's just what i love about it i love making everything into a project (laughs) and and the 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 algorithm the all-encompassing algorithm out there uh is, is sort of asks you for the opposite it wants you to just like kind of rapid fire churn out stuff. And uh, that's, that's another, again, one of the realizations that I've had in the last few years is like, okay, that's not for me. Yeah. Well, the algorithm turned its back on us. Uh, the YouTube decided they don't want to pay Certainly. us, pay us yeah. anymore for anything. So uh, we don't, we don't even get any money now, which is, it didn't matter. We made maybe 10 bucks a year, but it was nice to right, get those right. 10 bucks a year. Cause it's kind of like cool to get paid for it. But uh, you know, yeah, it's, you know, my, the best video I ever made, I think has less than a thousand views. So I'm like, I'm sure, but I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. So it's all good. So, um, back to Ernest. Um, were you able to, uh, get an interview with, uh, John Cherry before he passed away? Unfortunately, no, we were, uh, uh, so John Cherry is the, one of the creators. <laughs> if you, if you do as deep of dive into the history of Ernest P. Worrell as I have, you see a lot of people attributing the creation of Ernest to, many different folks, you know, some people it's like, Oh, this is a character Jim Varney created. Other people are like, Oh, well it's John Cherry. Uh, there's another guy at the ad agency named Tom Farrell who sort of parted ways at a certain point. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So John Cherry is like, he directed almost all of the earnest movies and a lot of the commercials and the TV show. So he was really one of the, the main, uh, one of the main folks, uh, responsible for this phenomenon. Um, and, you know, we had been talking to his family and, and trying to make a, uh, 
an interview happened. Um, you know, unfortunately, his his health was not great, um, and you know it, the timing just didn't work out. So, unfortunately, we did not get to talk to him. But I do I do feel confident that there's enough. You know, he wrote a book, and there's I think there's enough archival interviews that we can we can make his presence known and and represented in the in the documentary in a way that is appropriate and and befits his his role in this character sort of going viral in in a, a time where that wasn't a a phrase yet yeah well it was a magical team up with uh, John and John and Jim so um, for sure um, they they uh, they started making commercials and then turned it into a, a full f- film franchise of what seven eight nine movies and maybe a TV show something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine movies, uh, a TV special, uh, oh, one season of a TV show, which is the what uh, Jim Varney won the Emmy for uh, Outstanding Performer in a Children's TV Series. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it's, it's one of those things, you know, uh, the things that I tend to gravitate towards are these big, not, not big necessarily, but these like experimental weird phenomenon where it's like nothing like this had ever happened before and probably nothing like it will ever happen again. It's like such a, uh, a, a once, once, not even once in a lifetime, once in history sort of like confluence of right person, right people in the right place at the right time. And it all just sort of happened. You know, when we were doing the interviews earlier this summer, um, one of the recurring, you know, we talked to folks who were, worked on the commercials, worked on the films, worked at the ad agency. Uh, And one of the recurring sentiments that a lot of the folks had was, I don't know how I was lucky enough to get on board the earnest train, but uh, I did it and I learned a lot and we had a lot of fun. And like, that's, that's a goal for, for anyone's career. Yeah, definitely. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, I think part of, you know, it's, it's an interesting story and it's an interesting, uh, Jim is an interesting person and certainly how different he is, you know, I think at the time, certainly because he was in these local markets and because he was so good at playing Ernest, a lot of people just assumed he was Ernest in real life or that mm-hmm. Ernest was a real person. Um, and you know, that's, that's a credit what, to him. But you yeah, know what? Exactly. He still was an awesome slinky dog, and I loved him as um, uh, in the Beverly Hillbillies. So, um, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. he he did other stuff too. So it's 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 a, we we lost a a, a a great American actor. You know, you don't Absolutely. meet too many people named Vern, but uh, we happen to have a neighbor. <laughs> He's really kind of just like a you know wave to neighbor. But it, it's so hard. You'd, anytime if you do meet, so you just going to go, hey Vern. You know, it's just, it's, <laughs> wait, you guys live next door to Vern? What? Across the street from Vern, yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Hey Vern. Hey Vern. Do you ever, do you ever walk by and just like steal like uh, breakfast foods off of his plate through the window? <laughs> oh no, no. But I don't want to get my my fingers shut. Uh, by yeah, the we kind of keep our <laughs> right. but it still is just one of those smart. things you hear Vern is like that's the first thing that pops into my head. Hey Vern. The original yeah, yeah. viral guy. Gotta love That's it. That's funny. And, and any idea when when it might be complete, or is it still too far off to uh, to know? Yeah, I, I mean, we, again, we literally just started um, shooting it uh, in June, and uh, I think the um, you know each each section of the the film's development has kind of determined the next section. Like, you know, Justin and I got together, and we're like, okay, well, what's uh, make some kind of pitch and uh, my uh, my producer Valerie who's been involved in a lot of projects she was the producer on uh, little guys in space uh, you know she's also been instrumental in sort of like pushing the uh, the earnest documentary train along the tracks but um, yeah you know we the the documentary pitched led to sort of the Kickstarter and the Kickstarter led to shooting so each each thing sort of moves moves the train a little further down the track um and you know we at the time we weren't even sure if the kickstarter would be successful we had uh a a a hunch but it was the kind of thing where prior to that we had uh you know we had like a team of four people and we would go to you know various folks 
in the Nashville area, which is where Ernest originates. And, you know, uh, one of our other uh, team members is uh, Daniel Butler, who is a writer on the Ernest films and the commercials. And, you know, he would go to their, like, their contacts that they had there and be like, hey, this is like our idea. This is what this, is what this group is thinking of doing, trying to, trying to gauge fundraising potential. And everyone had the same questions of like, you know, very correctly, like, what kind of audience is there? Like, what, trying, trying to gauge this at all. Um, and so, you know, part of why we ended up with Kickstarter was just because we needed to demonstrate that this audience existed and that they were hungry for this story to be told. Um, all, all of this is a very long and roundabout uh, way of answering your question, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I would say conservatively, this is a five-year project uh, at minimum. And, well, Little uh, Guys in Space was worth waiting for, and uh, you can't rush perfection, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and I've, I've been telling people, you know, who, it, it's it's been weird in some ways uh, for my career to, to take this turn because people are so, and I, I think I feel a kinship with Jim Varney where it's like people know me for Lego stuff, and it's like, well, you, you know, I can, I am not, I am not Lego. I can do other things. Um and uh, so, you know, people have asked, like, oh, like, is there going to be Lego animation in this film? Mm-hmm. I'm like, you don't understand how expensive a documentary is, let alone animation, which is, like, exponentially more expensive. But um, the, the people who do know me as, like, a Lego person and a, a person working on this documentary now, um, the, the thing that I've been saying is that little guys in space crawled so that uh, the importance of being earnest could run. Like uh, I've taken so many lessons from the way little guys in space worked or, or didn't work as the case may be. And, and I've been able to use that experience in a really direct way on this documentary, which has been great. Cause it's like, Oh, I, I know what happened last time with this. Let me, now I know for next time, let me not make, uh, let me under promise and over deliver. I mean, not make all of these rewards physical because it will take me 10 years to ship them, uh, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's been, I can't, you know, as, as if I would ever, I have zero regrets about little guys in space, uh, none whatsoever. And, and certainly if you can have less than none, uh, I have negative one regrets about, uh, about it now that I can use use that experience and be like, well, yes, I did do this very long-term Kickstarter and it worked and it was completed. And, uh, I definitely took a loss on it, but, uh, the, uh, the film exists and everybody got what they were promised and, and uh, loved it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I forgot the. Um, yeah, we got, we got our disc, uh, and we're happy with it. And we're happy to have been a part of it. See our name in the in the credits there, and the uh, and the, the extra the extras on the DVD were killer. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no. Uh, the quarter <laughs> quarter speed commentary. I love it. I didn't I didn't even think of it. It's like yeah, you can't you can't really do a commentary at regular speed, but you threw it on a quarter, and yeah, you can actually almost get it all said in a quarter speed. Sure. Well, and certainly, you know, it's a very animator thing to sort of frame by frame someone else's animation. Um, and I think there was a, uh, there was the Bricks in Motion documentary uh, a few years ago, which, uh, you know, the folks from Bricks in Motion put together and they had a fundraiser and all that. Um, and one of the, uh, the bonus discs that came with that was uh, a, a compilation of, of brick films. And so I, I had, I put my film uh, playback on it. And, and they asked me for a commentary and I, I made a commentary and <laughs> trying to do a commentary on a two minutes and some change long film. It was like so difficult to, to say anything of any value. <laughs> so I think that's where the, the quarter speed commentaries sort of originated in my mind where I was like, I just want to, you know, I, I like, uh, I like, extra features. I love like bonus material. Part of the uh, impetus for the importance of being Ernest documentary is there's nothing on any Ernest release uh, whatsoever, any kind of behind the scenes interviews, nothing like he's just sort of like, again, like an afterthought. So this is sort of, this is sort of my own way 
to, in the most long game way possible, get the bonus materials for Ernest that I would have always wanted. Uh, and yeah, yeah. So uh, Little Guys in Space, the the DVD I'm actually planning. I'm in the middle of putting it together right now, and I'm not sure where I will be when this uh, goes to air. But uh, you know, again, one of the things of of trying to put yourself out there as an artist. I made a a Patreon account in 2018, and gosh, tried to do so much in 2018, uh, even independently of finishing Little Guys in Space. Put out, you know, that was when we kicked off. How about we animate that? I had my from the archives videos. And, and Patreon was another thing that I think, you know, added to the the pile of projects that I attempted to, to take on that year. But um, more recently, uh, you know, because I did finish shipping out all of the Little Guys in Space rewards, uh, you know, I, I, I had a bunch left. There's a box of DVDs sitting right behind me. So I'm, I'm planning to make those available to patrons as a way to just sort of... Um, you know, continue to uh, you know, benefit from work that I've already done, uh, but also to get these boxes out of my house. There you go. Uh, yeah. That's and, nice, uh, though. Yeah, that's yeah, a, and, that's and, a great know, reward. I love that. And, and it's but- it's ten years since uh, that project happened, so certainly there's people who, you know, were not not that they weren't around, but I, I do get a lot of YouTube comments uh, as an aside that are like. You know, it's a video I made in 2016, and I'll get a comment now that's like, "Gosh, this really takes me back to my childhood. So nostalgic." <laughs> and I'm like, "And I'm like, this is eight. How old am I? This is eight years ago. Like, what are you talking about? It's very surreal." So, trying to make uh, things available for folks who are, you know, were coming of age when I was coming of age slightly later um, is is part of my goal there. It's funny you said that. We gotta. Um... You know, since Dave did a couple of videos, animated a couple of videos recently, one of the comments, and sometimes it just shows up on an old video, was, um, thank you for creating my childhood. And I just thought oh, that yeah. was really sweet. I love that. It's like it makes yeah. you feel old, but it, but it's so sweet. It's like it, the, the fact that somebody actually, you know, watched your stuff and appreciated it. It's just, uh, I just thought that was really nice. That's great. Yeah. I, I, and again, that's like the kind of thing I can't, I can't hear enough. I love getting, you know, there was a, uh, uh, I think I posted this on Instagram. There was a, uh, a kid who sent me a letter like uh, sometime last year and was like, Hey, like, I'm a, you know, I'm 11 year old, 11 years old or whatever. And uh, I'm just starting to make animations and I'm, I'm inspired by your work and I'm going to make an animation based on the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And I just wanted to, write a letter and say hi to another animator. I hope you'll write back. And I was like, this is the sweetest thing. Uh, my heart was, uh, my heart grew three sizes that day. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, and I, I, I then felt bad because I took so long to reply because A, I was in the middle of uh, finishing the Little Guys DVD and B, I wanted to send one. So uh, I, I did eventually reply and I was like, thanks so much for your letter. Like... I love hearing from people who uh, enjoyed my work, and, and I hope that this this uh, DVD can have some stuff to inspire you further. Excellent. Excellent. I, I have Very. to make a comment. The, the mom in me sometimes has to say these things. I can't help it. But going back on the, the regrets things, like people really should try. I know it's hard, but you should never have any regrets because what the decision you made at the time – is what you felt was right at the time. Doesn't matter when you look back and go, oh, that was terrible, because you don't know that. Like, like to quote Bob Ross, there are no mistakes, just happy little accidents. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and before yeah. we get too far away from Ernest, uh, where can they f- uh, still support uh, support it and uh, buy the DVD and, and all that kind of jazz? We, of course, we'll put the links. Uh, we'll put the links in the, um, uh-huh, in podcast, the podcast, but... Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so beingearnestfilm.com is the website, and uh, we're taking pre-orders through uh, Backerkit, which is like a, a crowdfunding reward fulfillment uh, service. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's, I was, I was equally touched recently because one of our, 
one of our backers on Kickstarter wrote like a really nice long post that was basically addressed to other backers being like, Hey, I know you guys are used to having these Kickstarter things like come out real regularly. And again, having those like weekly or monthly posts, like that's not what this project is. Like as long as, as long as they tell us every once in a while that they're still working on it and show some stuff, like I'm cool with it. So just like be patient, everybody. And I was like, yes, this person gets it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, being, being earnest uh, please. And thank you. Awesome. 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 And I'm going to totally just jump in with something different because we're on a Zoom call and I get to yeah. look at your adorable um, logo and uh, <laughs> I just want to know how that, uh, how that, how you created that, where that came from. Yeah, the, the Paganimation logo, which I've always referred to as the Dino Shirt logo. Um, I, so when, when little guys, uh, gosh, where do I, where do I start this story? <laughs> when I made little guys... Uh, Pagonimation was basically like a joke name for a company. Um, and it was not intended to be the name of my company uh, by any means. I didn't think about having a company. Uh, but when I made Little Guys, there's a, a logo at the end that's basically like four little guys in uh, red, yellow, green, blue at the end of, of the film as like a, you know, one of those 1980s vanity cards, basically. Like, like you see at the end of, you know, it's, it's the sit ubu sit of uh, little guys. But, um, you know, by the time I started working for Lego and started, you know, creating a YouTube channel, being on social media, I, I realized that I wanted something more, you know, in, in a similar way. I didn't want to be just little guys. I wanted it to be something more, something that captures the tone of, of the kinds of things I like making. Um, and so at first I tried to make a very... Uh, sort of less stylized. It was it was basically the letter P, and it was those same four colors again. And and what I realized very quickly, because many people told me, was that it was the exact logo for the Pittsburgh Paints Company. <laughs> uh, my my buddy was at I think a Yankees game, and he was like, "Hey, I saw your logo on, on <laughs> like one of the ads," and I was like, "Oh no!" Uh, so I, that logo only existed for about uh, gosh a couple months probably because I quickly realized it and I was like, okay, well, I already, I already printed business cards, but let me, let me, uh, re, uh, circle back around and, and rethink this. Uh, and so, you know, I tried to, I did, uh, I actually found one of my notebooks recently because I was going through all my stuff in storage. Um, just trying to figure out like, what is it? What is it? Is it a, you know, I, I had some, some concepts that were like a, VHS tape coming out of a VCR that kind of formed the letter P. I had like uh, you know other other sort of like retro looking rainbow stripey things, um, and it was actually I was taking notes one day uh, on on an old, on an old podcast that I worked on that is no longer in existence, but I was I was you know listening through and taking notes on like oh here's where I'll make this edit oh I have to post this link. And while I was doing that, I was just doodling and somehow I doodled this logo just like it was one of those rare moments of inspiration where I just doodled it and I was like, oh, that's kind of a letter P, but it's also a little character and I like drawing it. That's it. I'm done. Like it's, it's like, uh, there's like that story of, uh, allegedly Dolly Parton wrote the lyrics to Jolene and... I will always love you in like the same day or something like that. Uh, it's like, not, not that I'm going to compare myself to Dolly Parton, but uh, uh, it's the same sort of thing where it's like, you can't control when these things happen. They just sort of they come out of you. And, and um, sometimes it's more about, you know, one of the things I tell in uh, students in classes a lot is, you know, when you get writer's block or, or something like that, go and do the dishes or take a walk or go to the gym. Any, any of those things that sort of like are sort of the polar opposite of like forcing the creativity to happen because that's when, you know, it's like shower thoughts. It's like, that's when, that's when you get like the weird moments of inspiration because your brain is sort of in, in a more passive mode. Um, and yeah, so I, so I stylized the, the little, I, I literally scanned the sketch that I had done 
stylized it as a vector, and, and that's been the Paganimation logo since 2010. Nice. Which is crazy to think about. Yeah. Well, I'm enjoying looking at it, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd love to, you know, in, in my uh, in my heart of hearts, I have a, a dream of uh, having some little, like, uh, what would you call them? Like, IDs, like uh, sort of station IDs almost, like animated with it, like hiring, hiring some folks to just almost in a sort of MTV sort of way, like, this is the logo, like, do something crazy with it. Um, but at the very least, I... I plan to have a, a proper uh, vanity card with this logo uh, preceding the uh, importance of being earnest documentary when it's finally complete so that uh, yeah this can this can be more of a, a signifier of, of a certain type of, of creative work and not that Lego channel. I get a lot of comments on YouTube now that like remember when this used to be a Lego channel <laughs> <laughs> like like, yeah, I guess, yes, but also no. Like, I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> no, person. I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. Enlighten me. It hasn't come up before. No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody mentioned our. Um, I guess it was on one of those videos again. I love how your videos just, the new videos just feel so old. And then somebody said, I think it was because of our intro. And I'm like, you know, Gareth was nice enough to make that. I said it's very special to us. And it's something that we'll, we're always going to have on our videos. You know. Oh, this is on, on your YouTube channel? On our YouTube. Yeah, We'd on have ours. Little monkey, the little monkeys, yeah, the that, little monkeys that go the across. I, I love it. And so it doesn't matter how old it gets, that's always going to be our intro. Nice. <laughs> Again, you have to do things that that make you happy, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we can kind of uh, go back to the beginning, the origin story, you know, what got you into film and doing film with Lego or stop motion? You know, what's kind of the origin story there? Oh, gosh, what's the origin story? Whew. Probably the late uh, 90s sometime. I think you might have you might have done a Lego Star Wars in 1999. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's around. That might be the one that's listed on. Um, on um, oh, my gosh. I'm brain. Um, oh, on the on the Brick Films wiki. Brick Films wiki. I think it yeah, mentions yeah. in it, but there's not a link to it. I think the first link is for Strange. Um, but you know, you were probably making some Lego movies before that. That maybe just, or I don't know, it might have been one of your first ones. But you know, I'm, you're obviously interested in cinema as well, making you know, probably just regular films with your friends or whatever. You know, what's what's kind of the story there, and you know. Did you go to school, you know, or, you know, what, any high school stuff, you know, college stuff, you know, what's sort of the origin story of your filmmaking and, and all? Sure, sure, sure. The whole, the whole backstory. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess to, to a couple of those points, the, I think the, the reason the Star Wars thing is on that uh, uh, wiki, and I, I was just writing this on a Patreon post recently that, uh, you know, I, th I feel like that wiki has been very closely and silently following me because I was like, oh, I, I think I'm, I posted some photos, uh, little guys behind the scenes photos that I had recently found where uh, I had way more photos from that production than I thought I did. And I was like, oh, I think some of these have never been posted before. And then I'm looking on the Brick Films wiki and they have, they must have ripped photos from uh, my website in like 2007 when it was just like, you know, I was just some dude making mm. Lego things or from Brickshelf, maybe, if, if any of the older users still remember Brickshelf before, well, excuse me, before, before, the, before the days of, uh, it was sort of the, the Flickr before Flickr where okay. you know, uh, posting photos online was still a uh, expensive and new enterprise. So Brickshelf was sort of a... a Lego gallery website for, for mocks. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the, the Star Wars thing was not the first, but certainly, you know, uh, it feels so, feels so cliche, but definitely Star Wars was like a big influence on me as a kid. Like not only in terms of it just being a movie that I liked, but the behind the scenes of it, that it was like this sort of, 
remix love letter that George Lucas wrote to, you know, the Western and samurai and science fiction films that he loved growing up um, and, and the ways in which the characters were so appealing in this world that felt larger than what was shown on screen. Like that was, there was nothing else like that at, at the time that I, that I was familiar with. So, um, you know, certainly Star Wars was a big influence on me, I think, wanting to be a filmmaker. But, um, you know, I've been a Lego fan my whole life. There's photos of me dressed as a Lego minifigure when I'm four years old. Uh, uh, yeah, and... Um, the, I'm going to have to look for that now. The, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I've ever posted those, but I'm sure if you check the Brick Films wiki, right. they've, so, they've somehow fi- found them. Well, they will uh, now. They do a wonderful yeah. job over there. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, work I just, but I can't say enough nice things. Um, you know, I've, I've sort of, as an aside, I've sort of fallen off of the Brick Film fandom, I feel, uh, just because, you know, I haven't been, I haven't done any stop motion in a couple of years, and it's, it, yeah, I miss it dearly. Um, but, you know, things like the Brick Filmers Wiki and, and certainly uh, your, your Brick Filmers Guild website, I feel like the Brick Filmers Guild is like what Dave and I wanted the set bump to be back in the day, where it's like this sort of like just very personal project that is just sharing the love of a medium. Um, well- well, you, and, I was uh, I was lucky enough that you guys uh, asked asked us to to write for um, um, for that, and I, I kind of would try like ten times harder on the articles for for <laughs> for that. I, I I wanted to write really good ones, the, the you know kind of the the the, the news articles or, or more just just the facts. You know, this is just the news, but I actually tried to really craft the best writing I could possibly do for those. Um, and you know, I wish it was still, it's still up, but I wish, uh, I wish it was still going. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it did not go unnoticed. Um, yeah, I think we just sort of, uh, fell off, you know, when, when something stops being fun and starts being like a responsibility or a chore, uh, more specifically then it, that's when you're like, okay, well maybe it's time we, uh, close up shop. Anyway, that's all on the side. Where did I where did I come from as a filmmaker? So Star Wars and um, Lego fan. Uh, my family was lucky enough to have a, a camcorder when we were uh, very young, and it was gigantic. And uh, one of my friends from school, his dad made like videos. Like I, I always feel like I'm getting this wrong because it's been. 27 years mm. but um i'm pretty sure they were like how to how to make how to play chess like how to play chess videos for kids or something like that anyway um he and i were hanging out and we i had a big lego city model that was on my uh desk in my bedroom and i was like uh you know kind of showing him the different parts and he was like oh we can make a video of this and so somewhere on some vhs tape or other i'm sure there is like the quote-unquote first film that I ever worked on where, you know, he, it's, it's funny to think back because it's so similar to how I often run stop motion productions now where it's like he, he ran the camera and took the pictures and I did the animation and we sort of just made this little model, like move around. There was like a monorail that ran, uh, not the official Lego monorail, just one that I had built. (laughs) And, uh, there was, you know, a police car drove down the street, probably, you know, very, very basic mid nineties Lego city stuff. Um, and, and from there, you know, I remember, I remember thinking that was cool. And I remember either slightly earlier or slightly later asking my dad, how you do that thing where the characters move on camera, but you don't see your hands. That was what I called stop motion (laughs) as as a, as a nine or 10 year old. Um, and it just sort of, it, be, it became uh, a, a thing that I just, I just found incredibly fascinating. I, you know, I grew up with behind the scenes, you know, I've, I've always, like I was saying, but loved behind the scenes videos. Uh, there was a great behind the scenes video of uh, the making of the Nightmare Before Christmas. I want to say it was like, you know, after the movie ends on VHS, there was just like a little featurette, either uh, 
it doesn't make sense to have it before. I'm so I'm assuming it was after. This was all pre DVD. Um, there was a. Uh, you know, I saw the behind the scenes of Wallace and Gromit uh, aired on PBS. I saw that before I actually had seen any of the Wallace and Gromit films. So, so I, I had an awareness of, of the medium of stop motion and, and it was something that spoke to me because it's, uh, you know, it, it is playing with toys in front of a camera, which is something that I was kind of doing already at the same time so it all it all sort of like made sense to me and it came together and uh, you know at, at first i've said this before in uh, interviews where like i didn't really th- think much about it it was just kind of a pastime and then sort of you know the more i did it the more uh interested i got in in different aspects of it and, and i think you know when i was a kid i always saw that as like I always saw stop motion as the stepping stone to doing live action films because live action films is what you do. And, you know, as I get older, the more I, I move towards live action, the more I'm like, I kind of just want to do animation still. I kind of just want to, you know, do single character studies where I'm the performer and I can uh, really finesse the performance as, as much as I want to or not on my own schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the practicalities of adulthood have uh, bumped up against the, the flights of fancy of, of childhood in a, uh, not in a bad way, but in a way that, um, you know, is, is best for me at this point in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I, I just played around with things, you know, um, I have two younger brothers and they would be, you know, my assistants or they would be actors or co-writers or you know we would just we just goof around like there was there was no pressure to to do anything there was no like i was just saying it was there was no responsibility there was no obligation it was just like oh like you got nothing to do this this sunday let's like uh let's make a film about a shark (laughs) let's make a film about a shark named harry uh like that kind that kind of thing so um and that's the way it should be, you know, I mean, and, and yeah. a hobby, a hobby should be something fun, something you do on your terms, something you want to do, something that yeah. really is fun. Well, I'll have to admit, I've actually been a professional brick filmer just for a couple of years of my life, and I enjoy the amateur stuff a lot more where it's just for fun. Um, it's cool to make money from it, but I, it's, you, can be, you can be so much more creative on your projects when um, someone's not paying you. Absolutely. And certainly something like Little Guys in Space was, you know, it was a film that, uh, you know, I always had the joke in my mind once I made Little Guys that, you know, what's the, what would be the sequel? It would be Little Guys in Space because that's, that's just what you do. Um, but certainly part of the reason for making that film was the reaction to, I think I had done like 30 or 35 videos for the Lego group before I started that project. And it was just you know, I had fun doing those and I learned a lot. Um, it was, uh, <laughs> what one of, uh, one of the professors at my college calls, uh, uh, researching OPM, uh, filmmaking, which stands for other people's money. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it was, it was definitely partially a desire to, to get, you know, every max episode is by and large the same right like in, at a certain point there's only so many ways you can have a, a, a bieber looking skater dude shrug after having caused some wacky antics in uh, uh, a lego play themed location so so certainly little guys in space was like trying to get back to that sort of child childhood flight of fancy of like oh wouldn't it be cool if i did this what if i what if i had an alien who talked about uh, toys that they loved, or what if what if I had a guy whose his mouth didn't move, but as he talked, his mustache moved? Like there's this sort of sort of like you know again like a similar notepad document of flights of fancy ideas. Like oh, wouldn't it be cool if I did this? What if there was uh, you know I never did a uh, a robot. Maybe the robot has gears in his head that turn one frame at a time. That that kind of thing. So, um, anyway, back to the, the origin story. Uh, it was at that point that I was bitten by a radioactive Lego brick. No, 
Um, <laughs> there was, uh, you know, uh, in a very similar way to, what am I trying to say? It's, it's funny now to go to things like Ernest Day and see a very young, nascent fandom sort of coming into its own, where like all these Ernest fans existed already, but they're just now finding each other. And I think the same thing was kind of happening with Rick Filmers. You know, certainly in, in the mid 90s, you had like uh, Lego, uh, what was it called? Uh, Lugnet. And you had uh, AFOLs kind of finding each other on the internet. But I think it was a little bit later that, you know, dozens of, of people, very young people, realized that they all had the exact same idea, which was to make films using Lego toys as the main characters or backgrounds or props. And so, uh, it, you know, I think certainly the Lego studios kit, uh, took, uh, some cues from, from that, that sort of, uh, budding online group. And, um, they, they had a couple of contests. There was, uh, the, the Lego maniacs coolest home video contest, which, um, wasn't actually an animation contest. You could, you basically just had the brief was to make a video that shows off your coolest creation and uh, send it in. And uh, there were some prizes and whatnot. Um, I think, uh, you know, speaking of the brick films wiki, there was a very uh, in-depth historical document video about the, uh, the Lego studios product line and sort of the contests around it. Um, you'll see some familiar faces in that video, but, um, yeah, there was, so there was that one. And then there was the Lego studios, uh, Lego movie making contest. And, uh, the names of these are sort of, uh, difficult to remember. Cause I'm like, yeah, you got that the, right. the, the, I think you actually the, have the, them exactly right. You, uh, you were a, final, okay. you were a finalist in the, uh, Lego maniacs coolest home video contest in 2000 with a day at the races and you were a 14 to 18 year old semifinalist for the Lego Studios movie making contest with Haunted in 2001. There you go. Thank you for uh, <laughs> no. Th- for thank you to uh, that research. Brick Films Wiki. Uh, pro- <laughs> probably Sean might have been someone else there, and I think Sean's also the one that did that uh, that one uh, video because um, I think you have it on your playlist. Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah Sean yeah. Sean's historical documentaries about. Uh, uh, a brick filming are just are wonderful, and uh, um, you can find those at Silly Pinto. Yeah, if we ever need to know anything, he he is the one to ask. Sean. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Great uh, guy. Yeah, so so there was a yeah, and actually, a day at the races is something that I've literally just digitized for the first time ever. Um, I don't know that it's going to end up on YouTube because it has music that I don't own, um, and I like I like the things on my YouTube channel to be cleared. In all, same, uh, same. Yeah, I, I so, argue uh, with Dave about that, and he's like, well, "What does that?" I was like, "It matters." That's why you need a second channel if it gets, you know, <laughs> busted. Well, I, I think it'll probably just be a, a Patreon thing. Oh, uh, but uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. Day at the races and haunted. People know haunted from from uh, you know it was on the Lego Studios website for a bit, and you know those were me as like a teenager, just kind of like f- fumbling my way through. Uh, figuring out filmmaking. Like I hadn't seen, you know, because a day at the races came up when I was talking to, uh, Sean about that, um, uh, history of Lego studios video. Um, I, I made an intentional effort to go and find it and watching it. I'm like, Oh, this is <laughs> again, like I don't have regrets about anything, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that, uh, I think cringe is the right word <laughs> or <laughs> I'm just like, Oh wow. This, there's, there's like, it's it's so it's and it's it's fascinating to look at because the difference between a day at the races and haunted is like night and day night night and a day at the races <laughs> um, but uh it's it's just so like day at the races is, is shorter it's more stream of consciousness it's actually closer to that uh that video strange that i uh uh posted uh, on my youtube channel the one from like 2000 and it makes sense because it's around the same time. Uh, it's the same year actually, now that I think about mm-hmm. it, but, um, yeah, it's, it's those, those were two contests. And, and I always tell people that 
the Lego Studios contest where I submitted Haunted was like the first time that I thought, you know, after having not really thought about the the purpose of, of filmmaking or why I did it or the uh, any of that. It was the first time where I was like, oh, maybe this is like a career path or something, or maybe this is something I could do as like a job. So, so that was really like a formative thing. And, and I was, you know, in, in my teenage years, I would make, you know, I, I worked on, uh, you know, some videos for, uh, my high school. Like we would do, if you've ever seen, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, there's like that really awkward, like two kids doing like, here's like the news that's happening at, uh, you know, the high school today. Like, uh, we did that basically for like morning announcements at my high school. So there would be a, you know, a video that played in homeroom. And, uh, so I did some like Lego animation uh, little intros for that. And it was just like an excuse to do animation, any excuse to do animation. I would always take. Um, and I think, Oh, I think one of those is on from the archives. There was like a Christmas one where I animated a little Santa Claus who like jumps down the chimney and uh, waves to the camera. Yeah, I think but, I, I yeah. think I watched watched that just a few weeks ago. Yeah, S U V H. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, student Union Video Homeroom. There you go. Um, so you yeah. probably got your hands on some some good some semi you know pro, pro you know uh, equipment. video equipment during your high school days. I take it. Yeah, and it was a weird. Uh, you know, we were fortunate. Like my my high school had like a couple of uh, video cameras, but I also remember like you know combining some like. Christmas and birthday presents into one thing just to like get a, a very basic camera, which is actually, um, it was a, it was a Canon camera. It's actually now my high school has like these, I forget what they call them, but they're like these glass blocks in the walls of the school and every graduating class gets one. And so my camera is actually in the glass block for our, our graduating year. Um, not only because I lost the, power cord and battery for it <laughs> but uh you know it's the kind of thing where like it was a you know the late 90s early 2000s for digital technology was was a rough period and it it, it often i'll say acted up as a piece of technology at the time so i can only imagine you know trying to rely on it now and i don't want any of my uh you know tapes to get eaten at this point you know? <laughs> yeah so uh so it's safely uh enshrined in the the walls of my high school i think that's cool. kind of like a t- oh, uh, visual nice. time capsule you get just get to keep seeing so that's pretty time cool. capsule that's a great word for it yeah yeah and it's it's cool because you can kind of see how you know the the i forget when that building was built uh probably in the late 80s early 90s but um you get to see sort of each graduating class and like what was important to them at the time or, or things like that. It's, it's, it's a neat idea. Very, very cool. Um, so, so, that, so that's high school. Um, and did you ever uh, post anything on uh, brickhomes.com? Oh, I'm sure I did. Okay, yeah. Uh, their heyday was kind of about your late high school, almost yeah, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, once again, in retrospect, even at the time I was like, I'm not a huge fan of like online forums. <laughs> I, I, I much prefer like, uh, you know, chatting or like one-on-one interactions. Um, but I certainly, I, I posted some things to, to brickfilms.com before it was a, a weird, weird cash in website or whatever it is now. Um, and uh, yeah, I started to sort of learn who other community members were and, and, you know, uh, we, uh, we unfortunately lost, uh, Tony Mines, uh, uh yeah. earlier this summer. Yeah, okay, sure. And I was, I was telling Sean that, uh, I was definitely one of the teenagers who, uh, emailed spite your face and asked if they were hiring, <laughs> uh, not knowing that they were located in, uh, uh, the UK. Okay. Uh, but, uh, Sean was saying that later or perhaps, uh, around the same time there was a thing on their website FAQ which was like are you hiring answer no <laughs> so uh, I'd like to think I have some small part in that. <laughs> but 
Yeah, I think things like, you know, the Spite Your Face films were happening and, uh, you know, it's funny they bring up BrickFilms.com because the way that I ended up at my first Lego convention, uh, which was uh, Brickworld Chicago 2007, yeah, seven, um, was because uh, the guy who ran Brick Films at the time, Josh, he, he was going to that convention and he put out like a, you know, a call. It was like, hey, I need someone to help me out at this convention. If you can get here, I'll like pay for your registration or whatever. So I was like, oh, that sounds cool. So that's how I ended up uh, at Brickworld. And, you know, unbeknownst to me at the time, it would lead to, you know, meeting Dave Pickett. It would lead to meeting folks from the Lego group there like a year later. Um, it was, it was a, a strange strange time um, you know when i made little guys so yeah so to backtrack slightly i made little guys in college and the thing that i always tell people is that i made a lego film because uh i was like well this you know you're in college you're paying all this money this is i'm going to make a film that's the kind of thing that i would want to make because later i'll have to make other people's things and work on their projects and that sounds uh boring yeah <laughs> and, and where did, so, where did you uh, go to college uh, NYU. NYU. That's, a, that's, a, NYU. that's yeah. like yeah. Yeah. sweet. That's like yeah, UCLA of the East Coast. Yeah. And, and it was an interesting experience. You know, I think the, the main thing that I, you know, apart from <sighs> colleges is so I have such mixed feelings about it now just because, you know, what, what college meant at the time and what it means now is like very, very different. And what was available to people, certainly in, in the animation industry, um, outside of quote unquote higher education is so different. Um, so, you know, when I get a lot of parents at Lego fan events asking me like, Oh, what, sh- what college, uh, should my, should my child go to if they're interested in animation? And I'm like, well, <laughs> how much money do you want to spend? How, uh, how rich are you? Um, but, um, you know, certainly what I took away from it was it was a time to like enrich myself and, you know, I, I, I didn't go to an art, uh, you know, there's a couple of art high schools in New York city and I didn't go to those. I didn't, I didn't really know that I wanted to do art for sure until I went to a math and science high school and I was like, Oh, I don't, I don't think I want, <laughs> I don't think I wanted to pursue a career in math or science. Little did I know, uh, you know, how, just how much calculation and knowledge of physics, and things like that is, uh, involved in, uh, animation. <laughs> there was actually a, you know, there was a certain point in high school where I was like, you know, because it's a math and science high school, you got to take certain courses and fulfill certain requirements. And at a certain point I was like, I can't, you know, I don't know from calculus. I'm just going to take all the weirdest math and science classes they offer. So I took like programming and there was a class, uh, the physics of sports, which, uh, unintentionally prepared me for a lot of animation uh tasks because it was thinking about things like how does how does a a human body move when it's throwing a baseball how does it move when it's you know uh, hitting a tennis racket uh, hitting a ball with a tennis racket that kind of stuff and it was it was i feel very lucky to have fallen backwards into that class because it, it in retrospect it's like oh that actually helped me a lot to think about physical forms and moving bodies um See, so you so do to, use that stuff that you learn in school that you think you're never going to use. You just never know. That's right. Yeah, and then that's another thing I tell people in classes all the time. It's like when you're in math class and you're like, when am I ever going to use this? You're going to use it when you're trying to figure out how many seconds, you know, 1,000 frames is at 24 frames per second. You're going to use it when you're uh, trying to uh, gauge, you know, if you have five seconds to get from, uh, you know, pose A to pose B, at what frame are you going to need to hit certain marks or start certain actions? Um, How many lights can I plug into this wall? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, You know, it's not, you don't necessarily need to know, uh, you know, if train A is leaving San Francisco (laughs) at 7.30 in the morning, uh, but uh, there, there is value to having a, a, robust, well-rounded education for, uh, for animation purposes. Um, yep. So made little guys in college, 
And was that Went like to, a thesis project or something like that? Yeah, like a yeah senior it, was, project? it was my, my, my senior year, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took about eight months to create it. It's been crazy to go back through those behind the scenes photos uh, that I just, uh, that I mentioned posting on uh, Patreon because it's, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And at the time, like I was just trying to push what I had done uh, as far as I could push it and, and do things. And, you know, I'm looking at pictures of, uh, you know, I basically took the unofficial Lego builders guide by Alan Bedford. There's a tutorial in there about how to make a sphere. So I followed that tutorial and then just sort of broke the sphere apart and stretched it or added slopes or, you know, stuck a, a facial feature here and an ear there and stuff like that. And that's sort of how the little guy's uh, visual language evolved. Um, and, and trying to do that, you know, within <laughs> the confines of, you know, a lot of the reasons that I use Lego is because, uh, or that I used Lego certainly when I was younger, was because I just didn't have uh, money, <laughs> mm. and, and I didn't have uh, you know a, a wide range of knowledge. You know, I didn't know how to sew, I didn't know how to do woodworking or metalworking and stuff like that. And you know, stop motion, you know, traditionally is is such a uh, multifaceted uh, medium when you, when you start to break down all the different aspects. Like, I don't know how to cure latex foam. I don't know how to, what paints are correct and how to ventilate my studio properly. And by studio, I mean the basement of my parents' house. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, but what do I, I have, uh, you know, 10 bins of Lego. That's easy enough. And, uh, you know, it's reusable. So, you know, little guys, very few of those characters existed simultaneously. I think in the behind the scenes video that's on my channel, there's a very uh, clear example of that in, in one of the time lapses I did where, you know, I take apart the, the mom character and I build the, uh, the I love him guy out of the same pieces. Uh, just because, you know, I think I think I had to place like a bunch of Bricklink orders even to have enough brown to do the mom's hair. Wow. And, and everyone is, you know, there is no, uh, this is where I feel like, you know, back in my day, mm -hmm. we didn't have all these dark nougat and other colors. And had Sand to walk green. 50 miles in the snow just to get to the Lego bin. <laughs> I animated with the back of a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was like, you know, all the characters are, have yellow skin because there was, I barely had enough. Uh, you know, brown and gray, I think, were the two uh, colors I really struggled with on that film. Um, and one of the photos I just posted uh, was the back of Murray Carter, who's wearing like an all gray, like business suit. It's just complete, like nonsense rainbow warrior. It's like stripy and weird. Anything you can't see on him is not gray at all because I didn't have the parts. Um, so that one was, it was, you know, it was a challenging project and it was bigger than anything I had done, but it was also very satisfying to work within these very specific limitations. You know, art, art from adversity is, is a phrase that comes up a lot and, uh, you know, trying to, to make the best thing that I could within the, the confines that I was given, both in terms of a deadline and in terms of space, you know, everything is on a countertop in a basement. Everything is, you know, when it's, you know, the indoor scenes are very, uh, very much brick built, but the outdoor scenes, I was like, I don't have enough pieces to build like an outdoor scene. How would you even make that depth? Maybe I can make the mosaics. Oh, I ran out of time. Maybe I can make them digital mosaics that I place in the background. Um, and, you know, I used, I was very careful to use colors, excuse me, colors that existed in the Lego palette and I actually scanned just like a, a wall of white bricks and then used that and like pasted the colors on top. So it's like, okay, this is as close to being built for the time that you could possibly get, but I just didn't, did not have the parts. So all the, you found all the mail. 
What's that? You found workarounds. Yeah, exactly. All the all the men on the street interviews have these like, yeah, workaround workaround backgrounds. There you um, go. There you go. And and did you animate that at thirty frames a second? I did because I'm out of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it was like. Well, you're going you for know, this '80s look, but um, but thirty frames. That's that's that's. I've only done maybe five seconds of thirty frame in my whole life. I remember that it was like a like a, a speedboat or something, yeah, right? Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you know I, I had done. There's the uh, the animator DV ad that I had done, and that was at uh, thirty frames per second. I don't know what it was. I think which you won first place in. Oh, thank you. that's right. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I uh, I couldn't tell you. I think. Part of it was certainly that I was just learning what frame rates were. Like, um, I don't know that I chose a frame rate for something like Haunted. I don't, I don't know if that was a conscious decision or if it was just like, oh, I opened the software and the default was 12. So this is 12. Like, I don't, I don't, I genuinely don't remember and there's no way for me to go back and check. Um, but yeah, with 30, I think... You know, also when I was uh, in school, it was that weird in between time. Like I was, I was in college when the broadcast standard in the United States changed from uh, standard definition to high definition. There was a lot of stuff sort of changing really rapidly, and I felt that there was a it, it posed a barrier to entry in some ways because it was like you know, stuff was moving towards this higher resolution and higher quality, um, but that wasn't necessarily achievable or affordable to me and who the heck am I? So, um, you know, part of why Little Guys has the look it does is because it's, you know, aping that, that 80s, 90s commercial style, but it's also because, you know, I didn't understand the, the broadcast uh, standards of like this new paradigm, but I I was very familiar with how standard definition <laughs> television worked, and it's like okay, well, standard definition is twenty nine point nine seven. That's what you know. You can't photograph point nine seven of a frame, so I'll I'll shoot this at thirty and I'll format it and it'll look it'll look fine. Um, and if uh, you know some of these, uh, I was using a Canon camera that I had borrowed from school, and uh, you know if some of these. Uh, images are a little bit soft or they're a little bit, the color is a little weird. It's, uh, you know, it's like the early Simpsons. We're going to make this, we're going to make people think that there's something wrong with their television because everyone is uh, a strange color. Uh, it's trying, trying to uh, hide imperfections within a, uh, uh, a, a veneer of like, oh no, this was intentional. This was an artistic choice. Tricks of the trade, people. And, um, <laughs> And, and Little Guys, the, that, that got your foot in the door with Lego, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so Little Guys got my foot in the door at Lego. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's again, the where, what the state of the Lego group was when I started working with them. I think if they, again, it was that thing of, like, we worked with the fans because we had to. Um, you know, if they hadn't been going through those financial troubles, I don't know that I ever would have gotten a job doing spots for them. But uh, it was sort of a a time at that company where they were trying to be vibrant and profitable and they were trying anything. And fortunately, you know, some of the folks who found me were very adamant that like, yeah, stop motion is like, it's the, that's, Lego animation at its its most inherent form is is stop motion, and that's that's something we want to get back to. So, uh, you know, I was I was grateful for that, and and they had seen Little Guys because it had played at Brickworld, and I had uh, been selling DVDs and things like that. And I guess it was, gosh, was it on YouTube? It was on YouTube in two thousand eight. So yes, um, and I had done you know. A couple of things here and there before that I had done um, a, a bit for they did that I think it was 30th anniversary of the minifigure sort of promotion where they had a couple of brick filmers do uh, some some stop motion not as like we're gonna hire you but more like hey here's a you know here's a couple bucks like make a video and like share it online and, and <laughs> use this use this branding uh, I think it was me and uh, I think Nathan Wells did one. 
um, and probably one or two other people. At, gosh, long time ago, but um, yeah, they so they saw they saw little guys, and you know there were a couple of false starts where you know I, I almost did a project, and then it would fall through, or like the timing wouldn't work out, or the what they were looking for was too the scope was too large for the medium and it kind of went back and forth for maybe a, a year or so and then it was finally with uh, space police that um that was the first project that i actually was hired by lego to do and uh, <laughs> it's funny i remember at the time uh, probably on like brickfilms.com or something someone was like why are they hiring David Picano? Like he's known for like not doing minifigure animation. Like why would they hire him to do minifigure animation? Yeah. Very weird. And uh, I didn't necessarily disagree, but um, you know, if you look at Space Police, a lot of that is. Uh, I was I have actually some quarter speed commentaries for those episodes on on my Patreon also, and in one of them I talk about how in basically at least for the first couple of uh, episodes of that space police series uh the main animation that people do is walking because i d- i w- wasn't that familiar with animating minifigures um but i knew i could do a walk cycle so was, you know guy walks down a hall guy walks down a different hall guy walks mm-hmm. up to a wall you know there was a lot of just uh you know, again that that opm filmmaking uh trying to to figure out you know new technology and this new you know, how to work with clients, how to, you know, execute on what someone else's vision was and, but still make it your own. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately I feel like that got, uh, that sort of went away as time went on. Um, you know, at at the beginning of my working relationship with Lego, it was a very much a, uh, a collaboration in a lot of ways. You know, I didn't do the, the audio or effects, for the space police series that was all done by their, their in-house agency team. Um, and, uh, you know, it was very experimental. It was very weird. And, you know, sort of as time went on and, uh, you know, the company grew and, and more people also did what I did, you know, uh, Garrett Barati, Spencer Katz, those, those sort of folks. Um, I think the, the ability to sort of be, experimental or be collaborative kind of got pushed to the wayside uh, which is unfortunate yeah the, I, I mean all of those um projects you did for lego they all have their own um charm and special qualities uh all worth watching all on your channel um yeah. uh, of course max is is just adorable i ha- i have my max earrings and necklace that I love to wear because I just fell in love with him. <laughs> um, oh, did was it you? Who, someone gave me a Max necklace once. That might have been you. It might have been me. I think it yeah, was. I, I think uh, if I, I'm trying to remember, I think the neck. I think part of the necklace broke, so I took the rope off, and now it just hangs on my Christmas tree. Oh, well, uh, that'll work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's now here. I was gonna just bring this up another time, but that's when we actually got to meet you. Um, that's right yeah and that was was a long time ago we were talking about this morning it's 2012 10 years ago wow gosh i I thought it was a brick flicks and i i I, and that's how many of those did you attend or i mean you were a speaker at them um at at you know went up on stage um i know you i think it was 2012 and definitely 2013 you were there but you were you a part of it the whole time yeah, so uh, what we're talking about is uh, Brick Flicks, which mm-hmm. was a, a Lego, a yearly uh, Lego animation screening in uh, the Raleigh Durham era of uh, uh, North Carolina at the the Carolina Theater, I believe. I think that's and, right. Yeah. And yeah, I Real you theater. know I it was sort of tied to the uh, the Brick Magic. Uh, fan event that uh i don't know if it still runs there but it used to run uh back in the uh early 2010s and uh yeah i'm not i'm i'm also not actually sure who's responsible for that <laughs> event like being created i'm i'm sure uh, uh original brick engraver tommy armstrong will will claim uh 
responsibility for having the initial idea of, oh, there should be a brick films in a theater. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was uh, myself and another uh, AFOL, uh, Will Stroh. Uh, Will Stroh. Yeah. We uh, we co-ran that uh, that screening for um, about four or five years. I think 2010 to 2013, and then I think 2015s was like a smaller. It wasn't at the theater anymore. Different I think it was city. just in. I think it was just in the Brick Magic event. Um, and yeah, it was, it was exactly what it sounds like. It was a brick film screening in a, a movie theater. I think Will had like a connection, some sort of either professional or personal connection to the Carolina theater. So we got, um, you know, two screening slots on a Friday night. Uh, it was usually, um, a all ages screening and then a uh, 16 or 18 plus screening, which really there's like, it's, it's brick films. There's not like where there's nothing really explicit, but it was probably like, you know, a couple of swear words and maybe some, uh, you know, folks on YouTube who liked doing more uh, cartoonishly violent uh, animations than uh, would otherwise be appropriate for a G-rated screening. But uh, yeah, and that was just another, it was another thing of like making my own opportunities. Like someone, either Joe or will or someone reached out to me and was like hey we're thinking of doing this do you want to be involved and i was like sure um and i i curated all the playlists you know i would have you know again i keep talking about my my notepad documents i would have like a, a notepad list that was just you know brick flicks 2011 possibilities and it was just a, a bulleted list of brick films titles and i would uh you know throw them all in a spreadsheet and and make a, a playlist and you know really kind of try to to be the the DJ of this the screening. It was a really um, special and, event. Yeah, it sure. was it was really neat for us. It was the one and only time we actually got to see our um, video on the big screen, and that's a very surreal and um, cool experience. And then meeting you, so you were like our you were our first, um, and that was really <laughs> cool. I mean, it was just it was so wonderful meeting you, and of course Will as well. Um, so that was a really really memorable and wonderful experience for us oh likewise yeah i mean i had been so sort of uh not locked but like i had been so ensconced in the the chicagoland area and their afl community that it was you know i wanted to branch out and and meet folks in these other areas and and certainly exactly what you're describing like seeing your film on a, on a, a big screen in a movie theater is cool. Like that's, and, and for, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier for a, a section of this fandom that was already like a tinier section, um, you know, I wanted to draw attention to these, uh, folks that, um, you know, didn't necessarily, you know, animators by and large are a quiet bunch. And, uh, I think having it tied to an AFOL convention, but having it be this separate thing, you know, we got folks who would go to a Lego fan event, but not necessarily, you know, there are other Lego fan events where there's like a screening room and you walk in and there's just brick films playing, but that's more of, that's more of the, uh, it's the public day and parents are walking around with their kids and we need somewhere to sit for 30 minutes mm. sort of thing. It's not like an, an event unto itself. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Oh gosh, I'm becoming earnest. Um, uh, yeah, so so Brick Flicks, I think, was like a nice crossover between like, you know, we would get AFOLs to show up to the, because it was a movie screening, we're going to the movie theater, like, and it's a nice, like, uh, what's the right word? Uh, when when a building is, is uh, preserved because it has historical significance. Yeah, no, it was, oh my gosh, a magnificent... Um cinema just beautiful historical historical yeah. that's that's the word there yeah. it is <laughs> it's a historical uh building and yeah. uh beautiful. yeah and there's there's a promo on the one time i actually cut a promo from the event is is also on my channel i think that was probably 2011 or 12 uh, but yeah it was it was very fun i would love i would basically you know we had i think i don't think i had an iphone yet but i probably somehow recorded you know for certainly for people i i had known for a long time i would record 
the reactions to their films if they couldn't make it and stuff like that. But it was it was great to, you know, there were a lot of younger brick filmers there too who, you know, were just starting out. Um, trying to think of people, other people uh, that I we actually Chris, pictures Christian on Christian the... Colgazer, uh, Acromorph was there the year we went. I think he went up on stage with you. And the year afterwards... Um, ben. I think ben, ben Young was there. Yeah. Ben Young, Sanjura, and um, a few other folks. Uh, that, that picture's on our website. Yeah, it's um, really cool. Uh, but, yeah, he, he's a great guy. Um, um, he's, he's, uh, he's running a contest right now for uh, Bricks in Motion, uh, which basically you can... Long as it's got Lego in it, it doesn't even matter if it's it's stop motion. It's just anything goes, and it's 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 a it's a nice. cool contest uh, uh, that that he's running right now. It, it's going to end next week. Um, after you know, this will come out after that, but uh, so it, it it ended a month ago. But uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe the maybe the uh, yeah the uh, yes the, the at the time, of yeah. <laughs> yeah, the time of this recording yeah time of this recording it'll be next week when it ends. Um, but uh, you know, Ben's a great guy. Um, we had him on a podcast a while back. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, I, I, I wish, I wish Brickflix was still, uh, still around, uh, or something in, in the Southeast, you know, um, for, to, to go watch a screening of some, uh, Brick films, you know, they still, I guess they're still, do, you know, doing screenings up at, in Chicago, uh, for their festival, right? You know, I've, I've sort of lost touch with that event, like, uh, you know, Brick World changed ownership, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, we... Uh, Dave and I both uh, <laughs> appointed successors okay. to our to ourselves as uh, cinema coordinators there. So I think it's, you know, I think the person who replaced me was Casey McCoy. Okay. I don't I don't know if I, I have no idea who's still running that event, um, and it's been a few years since I've been there. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, it's it's interesting the ways in which the, the Lego fan community continues to develop and evolve and how these events kind of come and go and how, you know, in, in some cases Lego does their own things to kind of undermine them in some ways. It's the relationship between Lego and the fan events is something that I'm uh, consistently uh, raising an eyebrow at uh, just in the ways where it's like, I remember there's one year at brick world where like, Lego Kids Fest was the same weekend and it was like within driving distance and it's like come on guys no. like this is this is a bad look um, like I, I've never seen a company support and not support its fan base so at such aggressively opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, they weren't too keen on brick filming at first, I believe, if I'm not incorrect. And then they kind of got on the bandwagon after they realized it, you know, I I have thousands of dollars worth of Lego and it's, it's purely because of brick filming. I mean, I appreciate Lego. I think it's a great toy, but it's a wonderful medium. I think, I think we have this wonderful artistic niche that, that that's just cool as can be. And, and it took them a while to realize that, you know, it, it, you can sell a lot more if people are buying it just to make films with it. Right. So well, certainly, you know. and, and I, I understand their perspective too. They're they're a business, and this is their IP, and you know they have to protect their intellectual property. Like I understand all of that, but at, yeah. a, at, at a certain point, you uh, you risk alienating your consumer base by you know it's it's kind of like the uh, the. Uh, what's going on with HBO Max now, right? Like the, the you, Warner Brothers Discovery, you know, tries to save, you know, a couple billion dollars in, uh, what was it, like taxes? Or I don't even know what the whole, uh, the, the details of it were, but now it's like, because they jettisoned so many projects, all these creative people are like, well, we don't want to work here anymore. We don't want to work with you. And the cost of that in the long term is, I feel like it's going to be far more than just whatever they would save, uh, you know, by canceling these films that were already almost done. It's, yeah. it's mind boggling to me. Um, and you know, it's, it's corporations lacking an understanding of, uh, not, not creativity, but lacking an understanding of how creative works come into existence. When bean when bean counters are making certain artistic decisions, it's not always a good thing. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's the the uh, 
often talked about money people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you got to run a business, but at the same time, you got to think, you know, long term. Well, and I know, uh, gosh, I, I'm trying to remember was was the year that Lego laid off so many people. Was that also the year they went through like two or three CEOs? I can't remember, but. Um, Certainly, I know uh, one of the CEOs. I, it might have been uh, Jordan V. Uh, I think he had, at some point uh, described the Lego company as like a teenager, where there's like all these limbs that are like off in different directions, and they don't necessarily have coordination yet, and they're still kind of like trying to, you know, the the, the nervous system is still developing, and, and so I think there's often a lot of you know the, the the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is screwing up in uh, in some of these situations. Yeah, if um, we if we can kind of go back into some of your uh, your commission product projects, uh, the the red brick saga. Um, one of the things I noticed on one of the um, on your um, um, behind the scenes is um, you wore like surgical gloves for some of the animating. Oh, that's right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what's kind of the story behind that? Because one of the things I have noticed, I don't know if it was for dust reasons, your 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 commission projects and, and, and your brick films, I can't find any dust on them. I don't know how the heck you do it. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm constantly fighting it. I don't know. Maybe it's because you have a whole team working on it. So one person, the second you take a picture, maybe they're looking at it in high res. is like, is there a piece of dust on this shot before you move <laughs> on to the next one? I don't know. Gosh, the dust. Yeah. Oh man. Do we have five hours? <laughs> so, and I was actually just, uh, uh, I think late last year, cause last year was the, the 10th anniversary of the red brick films. And, uh, I had posted, uh, similar collections of behind the scenes photos, uh, on Patreon, patreon.com slash Um, and just the, you know, it's, it's always weird to go back and look at, you know, once, once you make a film and you can, you can kind of go back and revisit it, all you kind of see are what ended up on screen and, and you forget sort of the, the things that were rejected or the things that went wrong or that, you know, didn't end up on, on uh, the final product. Uh, the dust from <laughs> the Red Brick Saga. So a couple of things. Um, Prior, the, the Red Brick Saga was the first thing we made for broadcast television at Pagonimation. Prior to that, all of our Lego-based stop-motion work was for web video, and web video of a very specific era, like basically you know, 2008, 2010. Like, like it was sort of still, you know, YouTube was only a couple years old. It was still this sort of nascent thing, and... I think like something like the Space Police series, for example, those might have went up online in 720p at most. Mm-hmm. But um, but Red Brick Saga that was going to be uh, 1080 HD for for broadcast television. They aired on uh, I think Nickelodeon, uh, maybe maybe another channel. I'm not sure. But um, you know there was it was not only was it in a higher resolution in a uh, wider audience of. Uh, you know, a different format, but it was also prior to that, we had exclusively apart from the toy story spots, we had exclusively worked with Lego's internal IPs, you know, space police, uh, Atlantis power miners. Um, but this was the first time we were going to be working with like the three big licenses. It was like Warner brothers, Disney and Lucasfilm. Uh, those last two were not the same company just yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was this heightened pressure to, you know, kind of make it like pristine looking. And, you know, the, I think internally Lego did not, <laughs> what's like a nicer way, a more diplomatic way of saying did not get it. Uh, they, they didn't, they lacked an understanding of, their own product at times and, and the way that their product was uh, physically photographed for stop motion. It, you know, there, there's some folks, certainly the folks who hired us 
understood stop motion and what what it could and could not do, but um, so, some other folks did not have a clear understanding of uh, stop motion filmmaking or filmmaking in general. So there was, you know, there was a pressure to sort of get things very, uh, to almost, you know, try to approximate the CG work that was uh, in, uh, in Lego uh, promotional videos at the time as well. And, you know, CG, you're starting from perfection and dialing it back. Stop motion, you're starting from a photograph and trying to approach perfection. Um, so we were, in terms of things like dust and hair and uh, any, any minute imperfections, fingerprints, um, we were always at a disadvantage. And so um, the surgical gloves, I'm pretty sure that was, uh, I haven't watched that behind the scenes video in a second, but I imagine it was, there was a, a Darth Vader helmet that was like matte black because it's Darth Vader. And I think it just, it was a close up of a minifigure. So you're talking like less than an inch and the dust and like, dead skin cells oh. from, from my hands were just like, <laughs> you could not get rid of them. Um, and one of the other things that I realized when I was doing those Patreon posts of the behind the scenes photos was because it was these three big licenses, it was unlike any production we have done before or since because there was a waiting period where we had to wait like weeks to get approval to go from, you know, here's here we built the sets, here we've shot the animatic, and now we can finally animate. So some of those sets were sitting on shelves in my studio, which at the time was a spare bedroom in my home, for four or five weeks. And so that was more than enough time to collect a, a boatload of dust. And, you know, you can spray the dust off with like a, you know, compressed air or a, a bellows or anything like that. But it's just going to go around the same room. Like it's going to come back. Right. So, <laughs> like a so boomerang. that was a project where dust was possibly the most, uh, the, the most we've ever sort of paid like hyper laser focused attention to dust. And, you know, we didn't at the time we didn't know, and I don't even know what, um, you know, we use a lot of Adobe products. I don't know if, uh, After Effects had a clone stamp yet that you could like go in and clone out the dust frame by frame. So what we ended up doing was bringing every frame into Photoshop and doing each frame manually um, for, for better or worse. And uh, yeah, I think because of that reaction to the dust on that project, um, you know, the next couple of projects after that which were, let's see, uh, superheroes and uh, the Galaxy Squad Max episode uh, with like the multiple endings. Mm -hmm. That the we were because of that experience on Red Brick, we were hyper aware of like dust and hair and things like that showing up. So we were extra vigilant to like you know paint it out or uh, brush it off. But um, you know, then of course it's. Gosh, that's 2011, 2012, 2014, the Lego movie comes out and they're adding in fingerprints <laughs> and dust and hair. So after that, I just, I gave up. I was like, you know what? If anyone complains about this, I'm just going to show them frames of the Lego movie and say, no, here, look, this is on brand. Like this is <laughs> I did. I put that dust there on purpose. Just for you. Yes. It's, it's the same as little guys, right? It's like, this was an artistic choice. This is making it, you know, we're really drawing, drawing the audience's eye to the tactile nature of these products. Is this working? Uh, <laughs> it it, it yeah. does work, and and I have to end because you mentioned you know CG, watching your your videos, you know, especially these uh, Lego projects. It, it's like your animation is so smooth. It's like it's all CGI. Um, so <laughs> it, it's really amazing, and and you know I I love all of them, but I I have to say I have two favorites of the Red Brick Saga, um, the Harry Potter. And the Star Wars, um, and I'm just kidding. The, the on the Harry Potter, the going down the stairs, the red brick. I mean, was that animation? <laughs> that was. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, it yes. So, uh, let, me, let me 
set the way back machine in my brain for 11 years ago. The, the staircase in the Harry Potter red brick spot that had been, uh, storyboarded as a narrow hallway. And what we found once we built it, according to the storyboards was that we couldn't fit our hands inside, let alone a camera. So we sort of re reimagined it as a, a wider staircase that could kind of have the same sort of like zigzagging pinball effect of the red brick flying through. Um, I believe we shot it. I'm trying to remember. I believe we shot it with, um, that might've been one of the first shots. I have a, a, a tripod head that's geared. So you turn these cranks and you can kind of, um, adjust the camera very, uh, in very minute, uh, amounts of rotation. So I, th I think what we probably did was we picked, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. There's probably five key, uh, areas of focus in that shot. And then we just sort of took reference photos and then by hand moved the camera to follow the red brick and you know you just you try to think about how to make it look like an actual camera move like the red brick's moving fast so you want the camera to lag a little bit behind like it's trying to keep up with this like wacky zany uh, MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. and uh yes that was definitely a, a real shot that's there, crazy there, there's thank you yeah yeah and it was it was a uh, you know i think uh I appreciate you saying that those are your favorites. I think they're my favorites too, just because the the strength of those was really from having so many years of films and sort of audience goodwill to, you didn't need to do much to sell a Star Wars or a Harry Potter. Like those are the two biggest Lego licenses right. at the time. Um, so th it was very, you know, apart from plot holes, like the Death Star blows up and, is Darth Vader also dead now? Like, what's what's happening? Um, apart from things that YouTube commenters will endlessly ask me <laughs> questions about, um, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty just fun and goofy spots. Like, it, it was easy to do that. You know, uh, the real difficulty on Red Brick was something like uh, the uh, Lego Alien Conquest spot, which. For, for those who don't remember, was a incredibly short-lived space theme, which, uh, as I understand it, was trying to approximate like a a, a PG-rated version of like Mars Attacks, which like that sounds like a contradiction to me, <laughs> but it was like these like it was like this kind of like science fictiony B movie uh, theme, which by itself is fine, but compared to something like Star Wars or Harry Potter it was clear that Lego did not have a, uh, a substantial idea of like what the point of this theme was. So, so that video, you know, that might be one of my least favorite things I've ever worked on because we, like all of us at the studio, were just like standing around scratching our heads. Like, what is this theme? Like, it seems like the point is these alien, like sort of like, like I think they call them clingers. Like these like aliens can go on like a minifigure's head and like, like eat their brains or something. Mm -hmm. And then, but then the storyboards was all like spaceships and cars, spaceships and cars. And it's like, well, what, what are we, what are we focusing on here, guys? Like what's, there was no, you know, it's easy to have a narrative thread if you've seen a star Wars movie, but for something that was like brand new and sort of to me kind of half baked was, uh, was very difficult and, and trying to communicate that in a, a polite way where I had to just be like, I don't understand this theme or this script that you've written. Um, it was uh, it's not one of my favorites, but but certainly you know Star Wars. That's the only time we've worked with the Star Wars license. Um, you know, there was a couple of other uh, spots that I think uh, Garrett Barati ended up doing, like some some Christmassy Star Wars spots that we just didn't have the the bandwidth to to pull off here. Um, yeah, so, so that Star Wars one is, is very uh, near and dear to my heart because, you know, who doesn't want to, you know, again, coming from that uh, that Lego Star Wars thing that I made back in the late 90s, which I think that's probably where the, the Brick Films wiki pulled that from is because I, 
I probably played a clip of it in the, the red brick behind the scenes. Um, you know, yeah, that, that actually, that with the star Wars one might've been my favorite just by a slight, slight edge, just because I mean, funny, brilliant. It kind of puts you like you're in the movie and also one of those, you know, what if it ended like this? What do they call mm-hmm. those things? Sure. Like a, a alternate timeline. Yes. Almost. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it was just, it was perfect in every way that lightsaber scene between Darth Vader. And, <laughs> I mean, it was just brilliant. I just, I loved it. So, and, and all your behind the scenes uh, videos on your, on your channel are just wonderful and so educational, you know, uh, you know, with how you, you had to kind of basically make your own, like for one, you did a Spider-Man one at one point where you had to make your own uh, web slinger, um, web, I guess, um, rope. And you couldn't use the Lego one because it's, you know, it's a string basically. So you made one out of wire and like little uh, uh, plastic parts that you glued on. To, and it looks exactly like it for the most part, but you know, it's just really creative brick filming there. But uh, definitely people need to check out your behind the scenes because you can get so many great tips and pointers for yeah for, for from from a pro film. i mean from yeah you definitely want to want to check those out yeah and you you also i guess most of your projects were straight with uh, lego but you did what something with warner brothers entertainment you did the lego dimensions yeah 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 well well thanks guys um yeah the uh we did usually our our lego based commission work was straight from the Lego group, you know, whether it was for an external licensee like Disney or Lucasfilm or whoever, it was usually, it usually came through, uh, the Lego, they used to have a, an in-house agency that was basically the, the, the marketing agency that we worked with, um, uh, Lego dimensions. We worked with an external agency that was based out of California and they hired us to, uh, you know, they had already kind of, had the concept for what those they were uh, meet that hero spots is what they were called. Mm-hmm. And it was basically a, a modern character because Lego dimensions was like this sort of, you know, uh, smash brothers esque, uh, IP crossover. It was, it was modern characters introducing older characters who, you know, had something in common with each other. So it was, you know, uh, Supergirl introduces ET because they're both aliens or, uh, you know, uh, Marceline, the vampire queen introduces Gizmo from gremlins because they're both, uh, strange and unusual. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the, uh, the crossover between lumpy space princess and Mr. T are, but we don't have to get into that very uh, deeply. We don't need but, to, uh, but I did love that. And to be able to, <laughs> to be able to animate Mr. T, come on, I pity the fool. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Mr. T. Uh, awesome. And, yeah. And so, um, you know, those were, those were fun to work on because it was kind of, you know, those were in 2017, I think. And they were kind of getting back to that uh, sort of collaborative uh, experimental style. I think because it was this external agency, there was, there was more freedom. There was more looseness to kind of be like, uh, have a back and forth about like, well, what could these actually be? And what's the best way to execute them? And, mm-hmm. you know, that was the, one of the first times we did extensive, digital mouths. I think there's like, you know, I had done a bit for like good morning America that had digital mouths that were real rough. Uh, I think the, uh, the red brick star Wars spot, I think Obi-Wan Kenobi opens his mouth, but he's, there's no actual lip sync. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the Lego dimensions was like, it was all, you know, we had been so used to doing silent, basically physical comedy spots and, uh, Lego dimensions was more like, very specifically uh, following a recorded, a pre-recorded voice track, uh, which was cool because in a, in a lot of instances we didn't get the actual Mr. T. I, mm-hmm. I think they tried to get him and then like he disappeared or something. Oh, interesting. Um, but uh, you know, it was you know the actual voice actor for Sonic the Hedgehog. It was uh, the actual voice actor for Marceline. It was it was cool to get to. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, it was cool to get to to work with like these. Uh, these known people and like animate to their voice. Uh, and, I thought uh, they sounded incredibly like, you know, perfect. So that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had no idea. I think uh, we did we did Will Arnett as Lego Batman. Like that was oh, that was fun. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like you know they're very short. You know, in in the context of the 
you know, if you look at the spots, not that much of them is stop motion. There's maybe like four or five shots per spot. And a lot of it is gameplay footage. And that was sort of like how we, we were able to work within like the deadlines and the budgets and, and that kind of thing. It was, I have very fond memories of working on those because uh, they, you know, that, that agency came to us, they knew exactly what they wanted and we were able to execute. And you, and you work, you, you, you basically lead a, 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 you know, a team of, um, uh, uh, at Paganimation, you know, um, I think one of your key people is what, Valerie Champagne? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, I've, uh, I've known Valerie. Like, mm-hmm. uh, we've worked together for about a decade, and I've probably known her almost twice that long. So, uh, yeah, she's she's a wonderful collaborator. She's a, a uh, <laughs> talented builder in her own right. I have a uh, there's a portrait in my home that she built of uh, uh, our our late our late dog and uh, oh. so so I have this goofy dog face always looking at me in uh, mosaic form but uh, yeah yeah you know I mean it depends on the project certainly something like uh, the red brick films uh, those spots we had I think it was probably five, a five person team. Um, uh, it depends on the project, depends on the timeline. Uh, you know, uh, do you guys know about like the good, fast, cheap triangle? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. So that's the, for the, for the listeners, that's this thing where, you know, you have a triangle and at each point of the triangle is uh, good, fast and cheap, and you can only pick two. So mm. if something is good and cheap, it can't be fast. If something is good and fast, it can't be cheap and so forth. So, um, you know, a lot of times we bring in, uh, extra people just because that's what is necessary to get the thing out the door on time. I think the most people we ever had was on the max galaxy squad, uh, because that had, that was the choose your own ending that kind of didn't work, (laughs) but, uh, it was, gosh, there was, I think three of us in the studio. And then I think five people remotely doing like, uh, compositing and uh, effects and things like that. I think wow. that's, I'd have to double check, but that's that's probably the most people that I've had on anything, any commission project. Obviously, Little Guys in Space had the most people because that was so long and so drawn out that, you know, people who worked on it in 2013, I would have to then text them in 2018 and be like, hey, I'm putting together the credits what did you do on this film? I wrote, <laughs> down, I, I wrote down, I have to put Ben in the credits, but I don't know what this means. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And I, I, you know, for me, you know, filmmaking is an inherently collaborative process. It's, you can't, any, you can, you know, it's, it's the good, fast, cheap triangle. You can mm-hmm. do stuff uh, by yourself as a single person, but it's going to take way longer to do than if you're, uh, collaborating with something with someone rather but uh but more than that i just like working with other people i like you know especially people who and i think i say this in the red brick behind the scenes video people who are, are good at the stuff that i'm not that good at and, and giving people a chance to sort of you know play up their strengths uh you know i'm not i'm not a good draftsman i'm not a good uh you know, I, I, I'm not great at like storyboarding, drawing storyboards. Um, so I, I try to work with people who are good at the things I'm not good at. And then, uh, you know, the project itself becomes richer for that collaboration. And then plus it's more fun and you get to learn from them as well. So absolutely. Absolutely. Good teams together. Uh, one of the uh, shots from, uh, little guys in space that I thought was just, just wild is I think you had a 14 hour shot with four animators. And, oh yeah! Uh, oh, oh yeah! And uh, that that you must have been exhausted. Y'all must have been exhausted. <laughs> that's that's just an inc- a crazy crazy shot. Yeah, yeah. And I talk about this on the the DVD commentary. The uh, it was supposed to be much longer, and there was supposed to be all this idling at the end. But we were just so like loopy, and it was like two a.m. Mm. And I was like, how how can we end this sooner than it was supposed to end? And uh, we had just done. A, a Max episode that was Adventures of Max. Uh, I think it's just called Adventures of Max Winter. 
you know, that, that classic play theme, Winter. Um, and uh, the, the ending of that, uh, it was a two-part episode. The ending of the, the second part was, you know, all the characters pose for a photo and there's this like freeze frame kind of like transition to like a still image. So I was like, I bet you I still have that, <laughs> that After Effects project. I wonder if we could just do the same thing and uh, have like a freeze frame transition. So I, I dropped it in as a uh, uh, sort of a test and I was like, yep, this will work. Let's just end here and have them all pose for a photo. And so uh, we were able to end earlier than originally planned, which was ideal because we were all uh, very sleep deprived and loopy. Some of those, oh, some of those characters in that shot, uh, we're talking about the, the final shot of Little Guys in Space. Uh, some of those characters had only been finished being built earlier that day uh, oh, wow. where it was just like, you know, everything, you know, I don't think, I think all of the characters arms in that shot were reused from other characters. Cause like, we don't have time to build new arms. Just, <laughs> just use whatever we're designing, just use arms we already have. So it's like the arms from like the creepy doctors and the arms from uh, some of the kids, you know, it was fortunate, you know, the, the transition from little guys to little guys in space was such that, you know, I didn't have to take apart every single character just to build the next one. We had amassed enough of a collection of Lego over the course of doing, you know, I think we did almost, I think we did just shy of 50 spots for the Lego group directly. In total. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, every, every project we work on, there's different kits, there's different, you know, uh, they don't products. build themselves either. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we had amassed enough of a, a collection that um, we could keep things together, and so uh, it, it made the reuse even even more uh, of a possibility. So, any chance that we'll see you and Valerie on um, what is that Will Arnett show? The um, Lego Masters. Yeah, Lego Masters. Oh, <laughs> wait, have we ever talked about that? No. Oh, so um, both. Me and Dave Pickett and me and Valerie separately auditioned for Lego Masters in the first season. Um, and, you know, the uh, <laughs> I think the idea of a Lego uh, reality competition show could work. Um, I think the way that they're doing it is a little bit... Ah, what's the right... Again, the right diplomatic phrase. Inauthentic? Like... Uh, I don't know if it's changed over the course of the seasons, but like, why are they so obsessed with like blowing up models? Oh yeah. It's 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 heartbreaking. It seemed, you know, in the audition process, it became very clear that, you know, like so many uh, reality shows, uh, certainly on Fox, the, uh, the goal was not to find the best builders, right? It was to who, who will be the, the biggest, wildest character. Ah, right. Uh, And, and building was sort of a second, you know, a, a, almost an afterthought. So it's a reality um, TV show with Lego as a secondary thing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think a, again, I think a, a reality show about Lego could work. Uh, you know, something like, uh, what is the name of the show that is hosted by um, Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman? Where they just like, is it just called Making It? Something like that? I'm not familiar with it, but yeah. Let me look, let me look this up. <laughs> And while you're looking this up, I'll come. Uh, this are some facts I pulled off of your um, um, your bonus section on uh, Lego Guys in Space. Uh, you had a crew of 18 people, to over 2,500 hours, and seven and a hundred quarter uh, seven seven and a quarter years making it. And just the characters alone was well over 32,000 uh, pieces, uh, Lego pieces. Yep, it's all of that is take. true. And you said you also said the phrase "making it," and that is indeed the name of the show. Huh. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so just to finish the thought about the, the reality series, that's a show where people just like make crafts and oh. it's so like sincere and wholesome. And I feel like that is very aligned with my brand, my personal brand as like an artist. And I think over the course of auditioning for Lego Masters, I was like, this just seems like it doesn't fit what I'm about as, okay. a, as a, a creator. So, um, you know, we got to, there was like, Gosh, I think there was at least six rounds of auditioning. Oh, wow. Um, and at a certain point, we were just like, I think we're good. I think we're okay. Um, 
Valerie and I built a, a, a fun sketch model together, which was a, um, a, it was a horror version of uh, The Wizard of Oz. So Dorothy was like a mad scientist reanimating uh, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion. Um, just, just in a, we were, we tried to, you know, think about what are what are things that we both collectively, as uh, as individuals and as friends, what do we both like to build? And so we, we put that together. But um, yeah, the show the show was not for me, and they uh, <laughs> they uh, asked me to audition again for season two. And I think I just replied like, uh, "Thanks, thanks for reaching out. You know, I think uh, the the overall tone of Lego Masters it does not really align with my personal brand. But if you all are looking for any uh, stop motion, uh, I'm happy to talk about that as a uh, a job opportunity. And uh, of course, got silence as a reply. <laughs> well, that, that's a shame. But, yeah, you, yeah, you do that some, would be you, that you would do be cool. Some great for those little inter, interstitial whatever um, stuff they they do some neat animations on there, little short things and. Yeah, you'd yeah. be a good pick for that. But there's there's a lot that, that uh, you know, and, and this goes back a long ways. This goes back to before the Lego movie where, you know, Dave Pickett and I talking at, at events and stuff, we had such an encyclopedic knowledge of everything that, every piece of media, uh, visual media that the Lego group had put out, that by the time something like the Lego movie came out and it was so, like, well executed and successful, everyone was like, yeah, Lego, Lego went into movie making and they got it right the first time. And Dave and I are just like, well, no, <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of misfires. You've ever seen uh, the adventures of clutch powers. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, uh, you know, I have a Jack Stone VHS tape that will disagree with you. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, I, I wrestle with my feelings on the, the media that Lego puts out because some of it, like the Lego movie is so, feels so correct for the brand and then something like lego masters almost feels like more of like a cash in or something i don't know it's i guess like, they have to do what they think they can do to to capture the audience and do things that will make them happy instead of kind of being more um authentic or yeah they, they feel like they are they're not true to themselves mm-hmm. and what they purport to be as a company in in, in certain venues like i know when you know when uh we started to to move away from doing work for the lego group full-time um it's around the time that they started their initiative to become like the biggest brand on youtube and and the way that i watched them do that was to break to basically break the youtube subscription system uh to the point that i unsubscribed because they would just dump it was like a I refer to it often as the graveyard. They would just dump content and you would get like, you know, I don't know if you have like a, like a Roku or an Apple TV or anything like that. But mm-hmm. if you subscribe to the Lego YouTube channel and you tried to go to like, Oh, let's see what's new in my, my list of subscriptions on YouTube. They would, they would just dump like 30, 40 videos at once. And so your whole subscription box would be all Lego videos and it would be, a lot of times the same spot like five times in a row but like here's the german version here's the japanese oh, version wow. here's I'd like, and it's like that would piss me off <laughs> it was yeah, yeah exactly so i'm like i guess you're becoming the 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 biggest brand but like this seems like a weird way to do it mm-hmm. um and they also sort of you know again i'm trying to think of a nicer way of saying cashed in like they they put out those uh what was that series called uh can't remember but it was like these three like fake influencers that they had hired to be like their youtube channel people and they would do like lego prank videos and and stuff like that it's like so what who is this for this is so this feels like a you know a 45 year old executive's idea of like yeah we're gonna get in tune with what kids love it's all, it's all about strange. making money, put money in their Very pocket, strange. you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny when, when I, I always hate, had to hate to keep nagging people, do you want to be on the podcast? And you were, oh, you were so nice to, to offer. 
And then when you're like, well, how long does it usually take? And, you know, I said it really varies. And you're like, well, I'll block off three hours. And you think, oh, three hours, that's so long. There's no, <laughs> and I mean, we're already at three hours and it's, it's yep. just crazy how fast it goes. And, and there's still so much, you, there's so many rabbit holes with you that are all, you know, that we could get into. And I guess we'll just have to do another podcast sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. And I mean, uh, like I was saying, uh, either on air or prior to the recording, like I, I feel like I've been away from, I, like, I've literally been away from stop motion and from brick filming for, for years. So I, I, as, as we move hopefully out of the pandemic, like I want to start kind of returning to that world. And, and so me reaching out to you to, to talk to you was, was sort of a way to like, okay, who are, who are the folks that I can like uh, reconnect with and how can I sort of, rediscover my my love for this uh for this hobby and this medium um because yeah you know as uh, like i was saying as i've done little things here and there i'm like oh i miss this <laughs> like i genuinely the last piece of stop motion i've done was in uh 2019 and that's that's entirely too long as far as i'm concerned I think um, wasn't that our last I mean podcast that you and I did together? I mean it's it's been a long time. No, we yeah, it's been at least a year. We did them anyway. in twenty twenty, but um, that's still well, that's still over two years ago. Yeah, we we've, we've kind of slowed down on that. I get I get hot and cold. Um, uh, so you were like the perfect, you know, like kind of like you're you know want to get back into your roots. Well, this was kind of you were the perfect person to get us back into this again. And excellent. Yeah. So, and you know, yeah. you're always going to be very special to us for many reasons, but you were also the first inductee um, in our Brick from Brick Filmers Guild Hall of Fame. You I were the winner that. of the the BFG Brick Filmer of the Year twice and the winner of the 2018 um, BFG Film Festival. With I mean, but which which is like nothing compared to all of your accolades that you have. I mean, it's just it, it's really impressive. You're so talented, and we're honored that you know one that we got to meet you, and that you, you know that we three that, hours to I talk know. To us. I mean, it's just I feel so bad and so guilty. Um, so we really appreciate it. Oh, I mean, I'm I'm blushing. Thank thank you so much. I honestly like after everything that's happened in like the world and and like all of our lives, how they've like changed so dramatically in the last couple of years, like. I think returning to something that's just inherently fun for fun's sake is important. And, you know, you're talking about like going kind of hot and cold with, with, uh, you know, whether it's podcasting or stop motion or anything like, uh, like I was saying in 2018, I tried to do so many things just like, uh, with like an, with almost like with an, like an air of like desperation at times, like just trying to like find like, the way that I fit into the the modern social media YouTube landscape, and you know, in retrospect, the answer is that I don't fit into it. And you know, sort of having that time away gives you perspective and gives you the ability to reexamine, like, oh, what is what is it important that's important to me about this this medium and this community, and you know, talking to people about uh, you know different approaches to work or the the, the things that I've done or the ways that I've solved certain creative problems. Like, uh, you know, I could, I could talk about animation forever. So this, for me, this is an absolute pleasure. I don't have any, you know, uh, <laughs> there's no, this is not, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, this is not a responsibility or a burden. This is just a fun thing to do. And, you know, uh, one of the silver linings of having been away from uh, brick filming for so long is that I can sort of, come back to it and rediscover like these sort of simple pleasures and then reconnect with, you know, the people who I've, I've met along this journey and see where the, the journey leads next. Well, that's awesome. Well, we certainly always wish you all the best. Um, all of the links to everything that, you know, that you're into right now and to, to, for everybody to find all of your wonderful projects uh, will be, um, on the YouTube video in the description. And the also, description. people, the the book, the Lego animation book, it, it's something you will never regret regret getting. Oh, tongue tied now. Now I need water. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and then also the and and get it. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I mean, Dave is using. We've we got that years ago, and Dave is still using it. Um, There's always something for everybody there. The Ernest documentary. Any way that you can help support it, do it because um, it's all worth it. It looks like it's gonna be really, really good. And and David just deserves it for everything he's done for us. And and by us, I mean everybody. You're you're a gift to the brick filming world, and we appreciate everything that you do. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have no words. <laughs> Let's well, believe it or not. Yeah, good place to sign off. So thank you again for joining us for three hours. Crazy. <laughs> Loved every second of it. And it went by so fast. It's it's crazy how fast it goes. Um, stay safe and healthy. And uh, just, well, just keep it. Hope to get in... to see you in, in person again soon. And, yeah, that uh, would be uh, talk great. talk to you uh, in, in other forms also. And and keep enjoying your, your brick filming and, and everything else. So. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. This is, Our this pleasure. is a blast. Yes. Thank you, David. Bye. 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 Thanks so much to David for being so incredibly generous with his time, and thanks to everyone who stuck with us through this entire podcast. Please check out our sponsors and partners on the Brick Filmers Guild homepage, and don't forget to check out David's amazing Brick Films on his YouTube channel. All of his links will be listed under the video. We want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, Something's Awry Productions, Frame 5 Studios, Mind Game Studios, Dark Dragon Films, Forest Fire 101, Spencer Katz, Paganimation, William Osborne, Sam Futhy, and The Tenacious Brick. You guys really inspire us to keep creating more of these in-depth conversations with the world's great brick filmers. If you would like to sponsor one of our podcasts, please contact me through one of our social media sites. The sponsors we have are always brick film related and are products that we use ourselves and highly recommend. We would like to thank Kevin McLeod for his wonderful music, which we use for our podcasts and in our brick films. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube, please like or rate, comment, and share on your social media. We'd really appreciate that. So until next time, bye y'all.